All right, so today we're going to talk about a trilogy of books that is quite popular on what I would call the thought leader industrial complex, which is just, you know, Silicon Valley thought leaders that give TED Talks and talk about the future of humanity. Um, and there was a book published, um, I think it was 2015 when Sapiens came out. I don't know. Do you remember what year? But I don't know exactly. Yeah, something like this. Yeah, and it was quite popular. It was on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, and then there was a sequel called Homo Deus. And then there's a third book in the trilogy that just came out um, a couple days ago called 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And these are super interesting books that cover a lot of ground. <laughs> and we are going to, for better or worse, do our best to try and break them down and talk about some of the interesting ideas that are in them. So Matt, I want to start off and I want to ask you, what would you say that these books are about? Okay, so this is a question that I was also asking myself these days after I was finishing them. And so the author, Yael Noah Harari, refers to himself often as a historian, which I think is interesting. And because I think that few people these days call themselves a historian, they mostly, or I think it's much more popular to call yourself a political scientist or some weird thing like this, just attach science to it, like a historical scientist or something stupid, to like validate your pursuit by like attaching it to science. But anyway, what I liked about this book was this concept that I heard attributed to Winston Churchill, that the further backwards you look, the further forwards you can see. So he's like, took a look back into like the beginning of like the universe and like multi-celled organisms and stuff and like just the origins of homo sapiens and then like that was i think what sapiens was about like talking about this history and then he in sapiens at the very end of it like presented this vision of the future that was like grounded in all of this historical context that he developed and then i think homo deus was like riffing on that and then 21 Lessons for the 21st Century was just like he established his bona fides as like a thought leader and like somebody who has interesting stuff to say. And then he just wrote about this modern, all, like basically all the uh, most popular topics of the modern age, like immigration, blah, blah, blah. And he was just like, yeah, I'm smart. So here's what I think about these things. Yeah. Once you become a thought leader, you have to write a book that is some number of things for X. Like yeah. Jordan Peterson just wrote 12 Rules for Life, and now he's writing t even 12 more Rules for Life or something yeah, like that. Like yeah, like 48 Laws and 50th Law, like yeah, the yeah. Robert Greene thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So I think, yeah, that, that's a good way to put it. Um, so what I thought, what like my high-level overview, if you ask me like what these books were about, um, I think they're very much about identity, and identity is kind of the crisis of the now, so to speak, where um, it's it's really the first time that I can remember where it feels like your identity is up for grabs. You know, like no one knows whether or not they should be calling themselves an American, mm. or no one knows what it means to be a European, or they don't know now that you have like global internet access where you can, you know, access so much different information, like what you should call yourself and what like your representation should be. And I think that it's really interesting how that plays out in the analog world and the digital world, where um, digital identity is a huge crisis also, where mm. is your representation, your Twitter account, is it your Facebook feed, is it your Gmail, is it some aggregation of this, um, who has the right to, you know, censor you or things like that. And the reason why these books resonated so much is it kind of addresses the question of what does it mean to be human, like mm -hmm. of the part of our identity that we all share, which is like that we're human beings. Like, what does that actually mean? And it, I think like Sapiens is um, looking at that from historical context of what did it mean to be human going like from the, you know, 100,000 years ago to right now? And then Homo Deus is what is it going to mean going forward? So what does that mean for the future? And then 21 uh, rules, I guess, would be what does that mean in the present? Hmm. So it's like kind of interesting. It goes like history, future, and then present. That's yeah, like, yeah. I also got that idea. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, so also I should note that the way these books are written, I mean, he uses a term in Sapiens that I think is interesting where he says these books are meant to be stimulants for the mind. Hmm. And I think that's a good way to put it because it does feel like just taking a drug and going on a trip a little bit. Um, where there's, All good books are like this in a sense, though. Yeah, sure. That's a good point. Um, I think we both use this analogy that's kind of like going to a fish concert where if you ever like hear the band Fish or any of these jam bands where they'll play a song. But then they'll just start riffing on the song and then they'll go in yeah. a different direction and then a different direction. And then someone will go out of key and then it's like, where is this going to land? And then they land it back like in some, you know, variation of where they started. Yeah. Yeah. And so you told me that idea once yeah. and I really dug it because you I think he's did in context of a Jordan Peterson talk where he just started like 
he started relatively like grounded in something that was happening these days and then started branching out into like greek mythology and you were like he's going off on some crazy jazzy riff can he land it and then he brought it back in like a really nice way and yeah i thought of it as well and sort of the context of like the beatles like that maybe sapiens is a little bit more structured like abbey road or something like this and then in homo deus it's more kind of avant-garde like sergeant pepper craziness and then i don't know in this like in uh 21 lessons for the 21st century it's a little bit more like normie like uh i don't know yeah it's written like a more like thought leadery political book or something yeah it's kind of like even sell out yeah in a sense well, I, I don't know. I, I still we'll, we'll get to that. But I but I just wanted to give the context because these books are all over the place. They cover so much ground. And just thinking about how we're going to talk about it, I think we're just going to start and just see where we go. So Yeah, sure. All right. So I think I know where to start, which okay. is the first interesting point in Sapiens when he's talking about um, what he calls the cognitive revolution, which I think is really interesting. Because um, we know about like the agricultural revolution, which happened like 10,000 years ago. And then, you know, have like other things like the scientific re- revolution of the Renaissance and mm-hmm. the industrial revolution and the information re- re- revolution that we have now with the Internet. But mm-hmm. the first one of these revolutions is this thing he called like the cognitive revolution. And this happens like 70,000 years ago. And I think th- this is so interesting. So he's talking about how the fact that Homo sapiens, which are the sp- species of, I guess, mammal that we are. Mm. was not the only species of things that you'd call like mm-hmm. human beings because yeah. you also have these things called neanderthals yeah, yeah which are very similar to humans and they just coexisted with homo sapiens yeah, and this is crazy yeah and i was gonna say um the interesting thing is that we had these multiple species of humans but then we know that only homo sapiens survived and the question is what actually happened to these mm. other species and also how much of their genes live on in sapiens or like in homo sapiens and like this was fascinating too because there was like some some ideas that like so in like eastern asia there was like one kind of like how to say like species that's sort of like homo sapiens but not exactly yeah sort of like neanderthals which were like colder like climatized ones in like north of europe and so i think it's fascinating because he was saying that like they don't Maybe with, like, this gene sequencing, we can tell, like, how much of blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I, I think it's interesting. He posits that there were two theories. So it's like, this is one of the biggest historical what-ifs of all time. It's like, what if the Neanderthals just survived and we had multiple species of things that were human-like just coexisting together? And, like, how would that affect what we think it means to be human? Because he's like, humans aren't special. They're just, like, one species of animal. They weren't even the top of the food chain until, like, 100K years ago. Yeah. Um, and now the fact that we are the top of the food chain, we think of us as having this like special identity in the world, which is like where all these religions and stuff come from. But like, it's very obviously not the case, just looking at the animal kingdom. And the thing that he posits that I thought was really fascinating is, okay, we know that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens live together. We know they don't exist anymore. Is that because A, the populations merged, meaning they just started having sex with each other and like kind of, there became like a hybrid Mm -hmm. that is like what we all kind of evolved from. And that's kind of the positive theory. Or did we just genocide them, which is kind of like the negative theory. Oh, yeah. yeah. And looking at the DNA now of um, like, like once we started doing like gene sequencing, like in the last like 10 or so years, I think that we've been able to deduce that humans have between like one and 4% Neanderthal DNA, which means, yeah, they did occasionally have sex, but it seems a lot like we genocided them. And he uses Mm -hmm. a line in the book that I thought was really chilling, but I thought was interesting was he says, to Homo sapiens, Neanderthals must have been too familiar to ignore, but too different to tolerate. Well, and interesting. Yeah, that rocked me. I was just like, wow. <laughs> what stuck in my mind, so I read Sapiens not so recently, but like a few months ago. And I remember that he was talking about some woman in the United States who they got DNA of Neanderthals and then were able to create like a fetus from that. And somebody volunteered to carry this fetus and give birth to it so that it was like Jurassic yeah, Park. It hasn't happened yet, but they said there's a <laughs> list of volunteers that are willing to have Neanderthal babies. Yeah. And it's probably going to happen like in the next 10 years that someone's going to give birth to one of these things so that they can I think study we should it. do it. Why not? Yeah, it would, it would be kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, and then so that that was the first thing that just kind of like blew my mind. It's like, wow, like humans aren't special. Um, and then he starts talking about the things that. Like as so humans were just one of many species, they kind of homo sapiens genocided these Neanderthals um, and then they start uh, evolving things that other species don't have. So they start talking about like this idea of kind of um, mythology where other species of animals don't think about things in the abstract. 
like you see a tree in front of you when you think about a tree but they don't think about things like the united states which are just these abstract concepts that like become part of a reality mm -hmm. and he shows like there's a like a linear growth over time of abstract concepts becoming more and more part of society and like us getting more and more removed from like what is the danger around this tree mm. to like ooh, i wonder like what the us dollar will do against the euro just like mm. thinking in these really big abstractions and that's one of the things that allowed humans to like um become the master species is that like one v one versus a lion a lion will always beat a human mm -hmm. but like a hundred versus a hundred where like humans can strategize and think mm -hmm. about like abstract things or yeah things like that like and even neanderthals neanderthals were like stronger than homo sapiens but homo sapiens were better at thinking of abstract concepts um and yeah and th this whole idea of just how cognition evolved um i think is really fascinating and it's also interesting because they didn't have writing until like 7000 bc i think was when cuneiform started which he talks about a lot in the book but before that we have basically no record like we don't really know how cognition evolved we just know that it happened um so yeah, it's kind of interesting, and, it, and it, there's a lot to like be get, like learned about it, I guess. Yeah, totally. And so, I also liked this is more that something he was mentioning. I also found that a lot of the themes from these different books, he re kind of repeats them again and again, or like reiterates them. And one of the things that he was talking about a lot was that humans are the best at cooperating with each other, and shared abstractions are a really good way of forming a community. And I really like this concept that shared abstractions about things that are patently false are much better for like yeah. forming communities than things that are true because it's like if there's a tree right there everyone knows there's a tree right there but like if that tree is like the like mythical tree of like our whatever weird tribe and like this dude says it then it's like if you don't believe it you're not part of our weird tribe but if you do then you are so it's yeah. like yeah bullshit is much better for like community forming yeah, and it's interesting because he, he, like, it's not like other animals don't cooperate, right? Like bees in a hive yeah, yeah. send signals to each other and tell each other where flowers are and operate as like this distributed botnet that's actually kind of awesome. Mm -hmm. But like they don't coordinate with other hives, right? It's like mm -hmm. localized or like a pride of lions will only coordinate with that own local pride. But there's no lion like trying to make himself the king of all lions. Like th this isn't a concept that exists, mm -hmm. but humans are good at cooperating like across tribes. It's like we can build abstractions and like myths that like resonate and do coordination with other tribes, which is really interesting. And what you were saying, which I think is interesting too. So he gets in like this evolution of mythology is super interesting because very much so I think that's probably what's breaking down right now. Hmm. Like in society is like the shared myth myths that we have are kind of like the oh, yeah. thing. And that's kind of what, why like the times are so interesting or dangerous depending on your perspective. But yeah, he talks about it. It's like, um, even these ideas that were like in the Declaration of Independence where Thomas Jefferson says that like all men were created equal. Like this is like a provably false thing. Oh like, yeah. I love, <laughs> yeah. I love this thing from yeah. Sapiens when he like goes through yeah. and then, oh my God, I wanted to tweet it, but it's like too, uh, <laughs> yeah, way but, too but it's like, oh, First God, off, people so weren't created. They evolved. Yeah. yeah. Humans <laughs> evolved differently. And blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah. God, it's and so they're not equal. They're completely different. Yeah, exactly. But oh. this idea that's like obviously false is like good for structuring a society yeah. around and he's like you you could uh like it's like birds don't fly because they were like granted flight it's like because they have wings that's why they fly. yeah yeah right um but but it's like and he's like there are other riffs on this where even if you have provably false myths you can like do really bad things like hammurabi could have said oh well we're we think everyone's different therefore like that's why we have slavery it's better for society Mm -hmm. It's just like, and that's the way like humans worked for a while before like modern kind of political thought happened, which is really interesting. Yeah. I always think about this in terms of the United States, for instance, like it's obvious to everyone that people in the United States are like treated differently based on like class and all kinds of things. And so it's like, why don't we just write in the law that that's the way it is? Why do we have to like have this fiction? Where uh, and so, but I was thinking that like maybe the fact that we write it in this fiction, like that everyone has equal like opportunity and blah blah blah, is that it makes the society kind of trend more towards that way. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that, that's that's a interesting point. I I always think I like when we formalize like abstract concepts like this. Like so, 
people are treated differently based on their class in the US. That's like very apparent. So I like things like first class on airlines that are just mm. like so in your face about it where it's like, yeah, those people have more money. So they sit in nicer seats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have less money. You sit yeah, in less yeah, nice yeah. seats. And it's like just making no like there's no um, light veneer. No, but you there know? is. They don't call it this. Like they call it economy <laughs> class instead of like, you know what I mean? That's so fascinating to me. Yeah, but I, I like I, I just find it fascinating when in society we do the things that are just like remove the veneer and they're just like this is the way it is. But even the, like Harvard, I know Harvard, but Harvard's just like you go here if you have money and yeah, yeah. you don't if you don't. Exactly, <laughs> like, exactly. It's just so obvious, you know. Yeah, but they yeah. still try and like dress it up, like put lipstick on this pig of like you know what I mean, like in your facism. Because like even on an airplane, they don't call it like you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, like working class seats and like. <laughs> capitalist seats they call them like <laughs> premium economy and like economy plus plus and blah 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 yeah um another interesting point he makes around this time too is like so he's talking about how right now we live in like he talks about the evolution of these collective myths and how our society becomes increasingly um dependent on them like an another thing that i thought was interesting he says this like during the agricultural revolution is the first time that we thought about like the future in like concrete terms because like if you're just a hunter gatherer, you only care about like what's around the tree. Is there a lion there? Is this safe? But like when you start farming, you start thinking like, hmm, I wonder if it's going to rain enough next month to like do my harvest. So like we started thinking in these like more futuristic and more abstract terms. And this just evolves over history. And like I said, he goes on a whole, you know, solo about it. But um, the thing that I thought he gets to that's interesting is right now we have like a world where we all basically share the same myths. And like even if you don't think of it, you're like, oh, well, Iran and the U.S. like hate each other they have different myths mm -hmm. it's like well no they still call each other iran and u.s as two countries oh yeah this was good like with agreed upon borders that have the both agree the united nations is a thing yeah, yeah. and they say the same languages and like they speak the same language and they you know threaten each other with the same weapons you know it's like the best thing is about isis when he was like yeah isis like mm -hmm. takes over like Iraq and then it just destroys everything that like had any kind of tinge of Western culture like all artifacts and stuff like this But then they arrive to a bank and in the bank vaults they find dollars and the dollars are like having the face of I don't know Benjamin Franklin on them But do they like set them on fire? No, they don't they keep them because it's like they also believe yeah. in this like yeah So they can't dispense with all of it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's like even though we have conflict they're in the same um same shared like they're the same mythological universe if you're talking like the avengers like they're all in the marvel universe yeah yeah there might be characters that hate each other but it's like the same <laughs> universe and yeah it's um but what was interesting so okay so he's saying money is the global the first global abstraction mm. whereas like and he ties this down to um like cortez mm -hmm. and Cal conquering the aztecs yeah, yeah. and the pizarro conquering the incas which is so interesting right because he's saying okay cortez when he came over to the inca like conquer the aztecs they did not exist in this world of shared abstractions. It's like the the Inca or the Aztecs were just a different world. Like they didn't think of Spain in the same terms that Cortez did. Um, but the one abstraction that they shared when the worlds clashed were that the Spanish really wanted the gold. Yeah. Yeah. And so they have to have this abstraction too because it's like yeah. if anybody wants it anywhere, then yeah. like it will eventually get the value that it has in the place where the people really want it. Yeah. So like, this person. idea that like money is the universe, the first universal myth, I think is really fascinating because like they had to bring them Christianity, but they didn't have to bring them gold. They already knew about gold. Yeah. You know, I like, have a friend actually from yeah. uh, Venezuela and he was telling me that actually like so when the Spanish came, they just like told everyone, OK, convert to Christianity or we'll kill you. And so they were like, uh, okay, we're Christian. And then they just like gave all of their local gods Christian names, like Mary and stuff like this. <laughs> and so, but it's fascinating to me because it's like, I guess like they did the same thing everywhere. Like Constantine, I guess, did this for like this weird Roman cults or whatever. And like also in like places like Ireland or like Poland and stuff like this, they did the same kind of thing. Just like mapped these Christian names onto like existing gods or whatever. You know, this one thing he says that I thought was really interesting about Cortez was that when he went to conquer the Aztecs, um, the, what he did was he came and he's like, all right, let me speak to your leader. Like, and they didn't know. Oh, my God. This is so fascinating, too. Like, so they didn't believe that Cortez. Like, they're like, who are these guys with, like, armor and ships and, like, technology that seems better than ours? And he's like, uh, I'm, like, a god. And they're like, eh, we're not sure. Mm -mm. But like, they were really good astronomers. That's how they navigated it. And he knew that a very specific eclipse would happen at a very specific mm. time. So like, it was like two weeks after they landed. So, and he knew that it would be a complete lunar eclipse where like the moon would turn completely red. So he basically like pulled this move where he's like, my gods are stronger than your gods. And if you do not accept me as your god, they're going to turn the moon the color of blood to smite you on this day. And they're like, eh, we'll see. Because they, they weren't good astronomers. Mm -mm -mm. So then when the eclipse happened, 
um, they're like, oh shit, this guy's a god. All right. <laughs> but like, it's like he used like science, right? Because they didn't have this idea yeah, yeah. Of, of science at the time. And then he uses that to get like a meeting with the leader. So he's like, take me your leader, let's have a meeting. And because like the Aztecs had this completely centralized economy, like like everything went through the like main temple and like the leader had to approve everything. Hmm. So he goes in and he just red weddings them. Like he just kills all the guards and like takes the leader hostage. He's like, now I have your leader hostage. Um, and we're going to like, your economy can't function. Cause like it was so centralized mm -hmm. behind, behind this dude. I think his name is Montezuma. Hmm. Um, and like, then he just like figured it out. He was like, okay, I know I have reinforcements here. We're going to wait till the reinforcements come. We're going to figure out where the cracks in their economy are. We're going to push. And he did this. Like, I mean, it's so interesting how they just like conquer this entire empire, even though they're completely outmanned. Oh, totally. And then Pizarro, like, because, um, he knew the history of Cortez conquering the Aztecs, just copied his exact playbook and did the exact <laughs> same thing to the Incas or like he goes to the leader and like, it's like. All right, red wedding. Like, kill everyone. <laughs> take the leader hostage. Wait for reinforcements. Yeah, like fast follower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's so interesting. Like how those, but but it was he was saying this. That's the last time that the like the worlds weren't the same. Now they've been like unified, and that was like a big change for humanity. There's a really good movie about this, also called Aguila, God of War, by uh, Werner Herzog, and it's about a dude who tries that, but it's like after all, like. Pizarro and Cortez so like he just flops because there aren't any other Incas and like it's just a disaster but it's a pretty funny movie it's not funny it's like disturbing is but it it's, true is it true movie? I guess I don't know it's a pretty good like one hour to spend if yeah. you're on an airplane yeah this is another thing that I thought he said was interesting this time so he's like I guess he he gets um starts talking about how different uh places evolved because I guess like there's there's this thing where okay, we have all these different empires throughout history and they're like roughly equal to each other. Like the Christians in the West and the, you know, like Muslims in Iran and the Chinese are like, or, you know, they fluctuate who's on top, who's on bot, like, but r roughly speaking, they, they're equal. And then at some point, the West just like ascends and like beats everyone. Mm -hmm. And like, there's a big question of why that I think he doesn't, he doesn't really answer. I think a lot of this book isn't about answering questions. It's about just like posing interesting questions. Mm -hmm. um, but that happens at some point. And yeah, I think that's kind of an interesting question. Um, so like one of the things he mentions that I thought was really fascinating was like, okay, like Columbus is in 1492 is when he set sail, like funded by the Spanish government to go like find a new trade route to India and discover the new world. Mm -hmm. The first voyage that a non-european country sent to the new world was japan during world war ii that is insane hmm. isn't that an insane like thing to think about like why did no other country send ships to the new world why was it only europeans that like started conquesting yeah interesting yeah it's fascinating it's not like they didn't have ships in china or like or Turkey. the ottomans yeah. yeah totally um i thought that was fascinating and he also talks about like railroads um like, so I guess the UK had seven times as many railroads as Iran at this time, or like in the industrial revolution. It's like, why, like Iran's way bigger of a country than the UK. Like he, he, he calls it like potential energy. He's like, there must've been like some potential energy that was in Europe that wasn't in the rest of the world that allowed when the industrial revolution happened for them to capitalize on it quickly. Because it's like, okay, Russia starts copying european technology they build railroads like the u.s starts building railroads like why wasn't china building railroads and japan yeah. oh yeah the first railroad i think in the u.s i like looked this up it was like an american company that went there and then built like a 50 mile railroad like from guangzhou to like somewhere and then the chinese government like a few years after just tore it up yeah it's just it's so fascinating it's like why like he doesn't answer any of these questions he just like poses them and i think it's interesting to think about because i always thought like there was nothing like special about the West that like led to its ascendance. It was just that like they didn't get killed by the Mongols because like the Mongols basically wiped out the entire Chinese empire. They wiped out the entire Persian empire. They this were... is in a Fukuyama book actually about the Mongols because like so they're really effective at fighting on like these big plains like the Asian steppe. But as soon as they got to like Poland, they started encountering like forests. And they couldn't just, like, ride their horses around and, like, shoot arrows as they were used to doing. So, like, they encountered just totally different so just environmental geography. conditions. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's and I also, like, but it seemed like um, the Mongols, that, that's probably part of it, honestly, is they just had their domain that they wanted to rule over. But it seemed like they were, like, kicking the shit out of Ukraine when they yeah, totally. Like, they went and, like, conquered a bunch of territory there. And they were moving west and like they had all this political drama where like their leader died and then they had to like go back for like some oh everyone needs to vote on who the new leader is and they have to recall their armies but 
I always thought that like the West evolved, like won out of this bloodbath because just it was like an accident almost where like the Mongols didn't quite kill them, but they could have. And they killed all these other empires that were like ahead of them technologically. But I really think that like um, Harari makes it seem like there was something else there. He doesn't like he just says like, oh, like there was potential energy there that didn't exist anywhere else. He said yeah. something about like ignorance, though. Like, I think I said this also on a different podcast oh. that we did where he was like, yeah, when the Portuguese like went around, they were like. Like approaching things from the perspective of ignorance, like we don't know and we want to find out what we don't know. Whereas like the like emperor of China came in at it from the perspective of like we know everything. And so like we don't have anything else to learn from like some barbarous foreign lands. So you, like why even go there? Do you think that had to do with religion? Like the religions of the... Or I, like... So I think it has to do with like, I don't remember where I got this idea from. Maybe I found it from somewhere else. But I think it's something like in Europe, there was more like a free market of ideas and then like also like one upsmanship or like the capability for this. So like if the king of Bavaria got like some new weapon or like some new advantage, he could like press this advantage against like Prussia or Austria or anything like that and like gain in relative influence. Whereas like if you had a big monopoly like the Chinese empire, then they didn't really need like these uh. small advantages so it's just the competition of your it's like why everyone in europe has a dope airport it's because they're yeah. all competing with each other and a dope train station oh because they're all competing with each other in the yeah. u.s the states aren't as competitive with right. each other so I mean, like yeah. there's no really good train stations in the united states but like every european city when you arrive there i feel like in the past you would like arrive by train so they all have like super grand really dope looking train stations so it's because they're like a lot of small tribes they just had to compete with each other and that's why they were like pushing the envelope where the chinese were all just like one thing and they just Oh, yeah. that's kind of interesting. I think that there might be validity to that. You know, this is also really interesting when he because he, he talks about like religion, and I guess like monotheism is a relatively recent concept in the sense that like from the cognitive rev revolution, which is like seventy k years ago, to like whenever people made Christianity, which is in what like four hundred A.D. or something. Mm -hmm. Like, um, there were mostly polytheist religions, and he uses a line that really blew my mind. Is awesome where he's like, okay, like, um polytheist religions are really good at explaining evil mm -hmm. because you just have a god that's evil oh, yeah where he's like okay like there's good gods and that's why good things happen there's yeah, evil yeah. gods and that's why evil things happen and like there's bad spirits and good spirits and they're in conflict right but it's really bad at explaining universal order so it's like okay huh. why does gravity work everywhere huh, yeah, yeah. So it's like who made gravity the gravity god but but it's like why is it everywhere like it right, works right, right. in every situation yeah, there yeah. has to be like one universal god that could make that thing right um, so that's like where it breaks down. Whereas monotheism, like you can explain gravity because like God made gravity, duh. Yeah. But then you can't explain evil because right. it's like, well, if God's good and he is all powerful, then why is there so much evil? Yeah, because and, he conceivably, if he was all powerful, could kill the evil or like right. the evil. But he was saying that it makes sense if you say that there's one monotheist God who is evil. Right. Yeah. It's like yeah. that actually, the right way to explain the world is like a monotheist religion that has an evil God. Yeah. But like no one... Like, has the for, balls yeah no that. one has the balls to like structure a religion around it which i thought was awesome like that line blew my mind like if you ever write a science fiction novel we're having one monotheistic evil god this is a great like <laughs> yeah um but i think it was interesting too where he's like um he basically said that like the roman empire was polytheist and they didn't care about persecuting christians like they didn't kill like monotheist believers but like when the um like religious wars happen between Protestants and Christians, they massacre each other all the time. And there's this, and it goes back to that homo sapien Neanderthal thing where it's like the more similar you are with slight differences, the more you end up hating people. Oh yeah. Like I find this all the time. Like the people who I really detest the most are the people who remind me of myself. And then something I don't like about myself. If I ever meet somebody like that, I just yeah. instantly don't like them. And then just like can never reconcile myself to this. But I'll say like, I have two things to say about like what you just said, which is that, he was also making the point, which I thought was very interesting, which is that Christianity is not a monotheist religion in the sense oh. that every place has their own patron saints. Yeah. And all the patron saints are just like local gods. Like, so Ireland has this St. Bridget, who's like the saint of Ireland. And like travelers have like St. Christopher. And there's like all these different like little it, mini gods. He, he uses a line about that. That's awesome. Where he's like, they kick polytheism out the front door, but then let it back in through yeah, the yeah, windows. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then another thing that he was saying in 21 lessons for the 21st century is about like this um, Protestant and Catholic conflict in the north of Ireland that he was like, yeah, you could explain this by like Protestants like have all like the power and money 
and like Roman Catholics have not. So that's why they actually fight each other. And that's like a plausible like way to explain the situation. But it's like it doesn't make any sense to like go the other way and say like, for instance, in like Brazil, that like the like peasants that are fighting against like the rich upper class, like actually what's happening is like that it can be explained by like religious differences. Like it makes sense to explain everything by like economic differences, but it doesn't make sense to explain things the other way, which yeah. I thought was interesting. interesting yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to go back to that point and say, like, I, I really believe that that idea that you hate people that are similar to you or just with slight differences is true. It's like, like Germans didn't hate German, like they didn't hate like the Japanese who are like completely different. They yeah. hated the German Jews who are like, this the is so same. interesting. They're to the me. same. Yeah. yeah. So just as like, well as like the idea that like in this time in like the 20th century, it was like. I feel like the situation of like Jewish community in the United States, in England, in France was like worse than it was in Germany. And like Germany is the situation where like the Jewish community was most assimilated. So that's so fascinating, right? Oh yeah. He, wait, he says this line also, um, I guess it's like a slight riff on that, but he's like, okay, like, yeah, like you were saying, like the Jewish community in like Germany was assimilated. He was talking about like during the industrial revolution or like whatever, 1800s, 1900s, like France and England were like not tolerant places to be. Um, whereas like the Ottoman Empire was super tolerant. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So if like you were anyone that just like wanted to like focus on science and not worry about politics, it would be better to be in the Ottoman Empire than like England or France. Yet all the science happened in England and France. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's just fascinating. And I guess Germany to an extent. Yeah. But um, that was interesting. I yep. remember thinking about that too. What did he say about this? Why? I don't remember though. He doesn't answer why for like anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, which is, and they're also like really deep questions. So it's like, I don't know why either. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to like summarize the things that I thought were interesting that I need to like spend a year thinking about. Oh, totally. Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah, so check this out. Um, so then he starts talking about, like, he gets like more and more modern. And because, okay. So I guess like religion basically died in the 20th century. And, mm -hmm. That he talks about this, um, that like the collapse of shared mythologies of religions are like one of the things that led to like the horror of the 20th century. Whereas, like, when people just like they lost the narratives, right? Like, the narratives and, are, and myths are so important because they make like the suffering worthwhile. And like, the myths that evolved are like nationalism and things like he, he calls it like, um, there were three competing mythologies like yeah, fascism and liberalism and communism yeah became like competing like yeah. myths for how like uh, as religion died this is what replaced it um yeah 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 there's like the nietzsche thing like god is dead yeah exactly yeah um and obviously uh this goes horribly wrong for the world and then it's so interesting because he talks about like uh and, and it's interesting that people don't think of these as religions but he's positing that they serve oh, the same yeah, purpose of course they're religions that's yeah. so fascinating oh yeah. yeah 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 i really like this one idea that he was saying about religions, which was that like, they're just like some made up. Oh, a lie. It's like if something, Oh, fake news. He was talking about what's the difference between fake news and religion. And fake news is when a thousand people believe something for a month, but a religion is when a million people believe something for a hundred years. <laughs> like, <laughs> a religion is like when a million people believe for a hundred years, like bullshit story. And then like a fake news is when a thousand people believe for a month. It's so funny. And then he was like, okay, so like maybe if you're like a, like fundamentalist Christian in like the United States South, then you'll be like really offended that I said that. But think about this. It's like, what would you call, so like maybe you wouldn't say that Christianity is just like a lie, but would you say that like Islam is like just a lie that a bunch of people believe? Or would you say that like Scientology is just a lie that a bunch of people believe? So yeah. it's like on some level, every person is like thinking that like religion is just a big lie that a bunch of people believe for no reason. Fucking right. Amazing. And, and then he makes that shift to like the things that we believe now are just lies people believe for no reason. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, which I think- Humanism. Yeah, well, that, okay, so that's, like, what the, like, it gets more into that, but I was saying about, um, like, these ideologies now, like, nationalism, for example, like, the whole point of religion is that it, like, indoctrinates you because it makes your suffering justifiable, that's, like, mm -hmm. the whole point of it is, like, well, the world sucks, and, like, there's a lot of bad shit that happens, but it's, like, for these reasons, Oh yeah, yeah and, yeah. like, the more you suffer, the more, like, leveraged you are into it, because you're, like, well, I've suffered a lot, so, like, this better be right, like, I can't tolerate it if it's not right, so it has to be right, right, and, like, that became nationalism, where it was, like, Oh, like I have to die for my country because like if I get my arm blown off in like the trenches yeah. and it's for no reason, that's bad. So like yeah. it better be for my country. So my country has to be great. And that's like why nationalism became so big. And then he's talking about these three competing things like fascism, communism, and nationalism and uh, liberalism. And then he's like, okay, so fascism dies um, after World War II. It's like over. Like you can't, like you cannot 
the and he talks about fascism in a way that I thought was really interesting. Where he said basically what fascism is is like nationalism, where nationalism is the sole identity that you're allowed to have. So yeah, like yeah. you can't hedge your identity on any other ideology except the nation state. So like it was really interesting. It's like that, and I guess um, that's what Germany was so good at is like p- painting that image in such a way where like your only loyalty, like you weren't to the church and to the nation state. It was only the nation yeah, state. But then he also talks yeah. about how like right after like in 1945, then like it's not like every he was he made yeah. this really nice point, which is that like yeah, like so like. 20% of like Nazi gal lighters and like 10% of generals also killed themselves after like Hitler blew his brains out. But he was like, yeah, but that means 90% of generals and 80% of gal lighters like just went on living normally after they were just like, oh, well, okay, that was wrong. So like yeah. I have other things in my life to live for. So like, let's just keep. Yeah. He made trucking. it seem like the German state was more rebellious, like than it's led on to be because people were like not so dedicated to the state, even though like a lot of people were. What I thought. So one fascinating thing though, was that like I, so Italian fascism had like this logo always of the Italian flag and then a kind of weird looking ax with like a bunch of sticks combined together. And he was saying that like the etymology of the word fascism is like a bunch of sticks all together, which oh. was super fascinating to me because I never put two and two together and understood the reason for that Mussolini crest thing. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So I guess, um, so fascism dies after world war two. No. Or also, oh, sorry. Go it ahead. kind of made me think so about what you were saying in relation to like how we just have to like double down on nationalism and think our nation's great. If you like get your arm blown off or whatever, because it was like, he told this story that I thought was fascinating about how after Italy entered world war one, and then they declare war against like Austria Hungary and they try to take like Trento and Trieste and they have like one battle, but like the Austro Hungarian Empire had like really well fortified those positions. So they attack it with ten thousand troops, all of them die. And they're like, Okay, fuck, like <laughs> we could admit that this was a stupid idea, or we could just double down on it. And it's like much easier for a politician to be like, Yeah, like the eternal Italian nation and we're gonna go and reconquer like the glories of ancient Rome and blah blah blah. Like we need twenty thousand more people is like way easier to be like yeah, like your Giuseppe died for like some stupid reason and it was like my bad, but like whatever. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. That was so interesting. I I, I, that, I, I remember the point that he, that you're talking about where he's like, you're basically hedged as a pol- or leveraged as a politician at that point where it's like, oh wait, 10,000 people die trying to take this port. So we must get this port so they don't die in vain. Because yeah, I yeah. can't look those parents in the eye yeah, and tell yeah. them they died for nothing. Exactly. So like, let's try- send more people to die so that we can get the port. And they finally never got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like 100,000 people fuck. Yeah, but it's like if the politician just said, all right, this is a bad idea. Sorry, he died in vain. We're not getting the port. It's yeah. like too hard for the politicians. Yeah, so they just yeah. double down, double down, oh, double down, which is basically God. like what the U.S. does in like Afghanistan now, yeah, right? Yeah, it's like yeah. a fucking disaster, but you can't just like say that like, oh, yeah, we just fucked this up. They have to like be like, nope, we're good. Nope, we're, we're going until we build something. Like yeah, 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 we're going to yeah. keep trying until we get the ball in the hoop. Oh, and this is so uh, fascinating as well because it's like the difference to me between like politicians and scientists is like that when – or like government programs and like startups it's like when a government program is wrong and like doesn't work then the like solution is give it more money whereas like if a startup doesn't work it's like oh yeah you're stupid and that was a bad idea (laughs) but like if a government program doesn't work it's like oh yeah because you didn't fund it enough that's why it doesn't work yeah 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 yeah. Um, (laughs) so after fascism dies now it's like the battle between communism and liberalism wait but fascism didn't die and like part of the thing that i thought was interesting as well was this idea of evolutionary humanism which was like part of the like i don't know concept of fascism or whatever which i thought was fascinating in the sense of like that he was talking about this as like in relation to that voyager spacecraft and the idea that like so they put all these different things like wolves Mm -hmm. howling and like some like chuck berry and beethoven's fifth and so on and talking about the idea of like cultural relativism and all these kind of things because i think this is fascinating and i don't know if i'm like uh, i don't know like i just always felt that like okay so there's like i read this book once like a while ago and when i was in college called uh zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and the whole point of the book is that like what's quality and it's like when you look at something you can assess its quality like before you even like know that you're looking at the thing it's like if you look at a statue you can know if it's a shitty statue or a good statue just by looking at it. you just know and so it's like i just Mm -hmm. think that like some like works of art and like whatever are just objectively better than other ones so it's like yeah like some like chanting or whatever 
like if i hear beethoven's fifth i just think that's objectively better and it's like yeah, yeah so it's kind of steve jobs had this line that i really liked where he said that greatness is transcendent which means that like if you can have like michael jordan who's like a great basketball player and then you can have like a van gogh painting which is a great painting and like there's some commonality to that that is just like this abstraction of greatness and he's like like him like tripping acid in india like was all about like figuring this out where he's like there is something that's just objective and transcendent about the idea of being great and it like you can see that and capture it and then bring it into like whatever you're doing so he's like i'm building computers but I know that there's this objective like thing that means like this is legitimately great and I need to make sure my computers have it. Hmm. Like even if I'm just building computers. Um, and I think that's why Apple computers were so good is that hmm. he like actually saw that this was a thing. Like even if you can't capture it, like he, you know, like really like pushed himself to like think about like this really abstract view of the world. And he's like, I know what great is and like I have to have that in whatever I'm doing if it's building computers or iPhones or, you know, whatever. Yeah, and then it also got into the idea of this, like, thing in 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, where he was talking about how, in our modern age, like, the idea of racism is completely discredited. It's like, if you say that, like, because of racial, like, genetic things, that, like, somebody does anything worse than another, this is, like, bogus and bullshit. But, like, culturalism is totally not. And it's like, nowadays, we cast everything in terms of culturalism. It's like, so when, and he used this really nice example, which I just thought was so interesting. It's like, so people from, like, hot, land and people from like coldia yeah. and it's like hot land culture is like if you have a problem with somebody just like say it out immediately and like get it on the table and like flesh out your ideas because that's the only way to resolve it whereas like coldia culture is like if like you have a problem with somebody just like don't bring it up like whatever just like try and you know what i mean like be terse but also polite and just like work around it and how like if there's somebody from hot land like immigrates to coldia and then they like are trying to like get a job there then like they'll never get pos promoted to like a upper management position or anything like this because it's like when they're trying to make the decision of who to promote they'll be like well that dude from hotland it's like yeah he's good but like he has this like weird social thing where like every time he gets in like an argument with somebody he like just freaks out and it's like yeah he made an interesting point like riffing on that where he was he said um like people think it's an improvement objectively that people are now culturist as opposed to racist where they're like, well, yeah, I mean, like, the color of your skin doesn't matter, but, like, there are cultural differences that matter. And he said, like, this should be an improvement because it's, like, great. Like, you know, people, like, they admit that we're all this, you know, same human beings and, mm -hmm. like, same capabilities, and now it's just, like, where you grew up maybe affects you. But he said, like, it's actually kind of bad because it, for it means, like, you judge people more for not assimilating because mm -hmm. you're, like, you know, if, like, you, you're, like, racist, you're, like, well, you're a different race. That's why you're not the same as me. So it's not your fault. But if like you're culturist, it means like, oh, why don't you assimilate? You have the capability of doing it, mm -hmm. you know? So it, like actually like can like lead to like more dissonance because people like have higher expectations for you. So like even though it's like seems like an improvement, it can lead to like more degradation, which I thought was interesting. But wait, I wanted to ask you, why did you say fascism isn't dead? As oh, because he was saying about like that, like I guess some of this like core components of like, that ideas like that were part of this like fascist ideology were like this kind of evolutionary humanism which he talked oh. about and then he was saying that like the like some of the ideas of like this evolutionary humanism which is that like we can create humans that are like transcendent and like better than like they used to be like so for instance like the third reich had this idea that it would be done through like genocide and like whatever like racial like and like genetic selectivity or whatever so, like, this is their idea of conceiving of superhumans, yeah. But then, like, now we have the idea of superhumans, but we just, by different means, we're like, yeah, we're going to create superhumans by, like, taking these drugs and, like, improving our minds with this thing and, like, having LASIK eye surgery and, like, blah, 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 blah. We're going to create superhumans with, like, genetic engineering and so on. We're just not going to do it in the other way. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, yeah. So, a lot of this, or a lot of homo deus, I guess, talks about um, kind of, like, like biotech and AI and like how that's gonna, what that's going to mean for the future and posits a lot of interesting ideas. I, I <laughs> his guess book like, is so funny. He's just like some kind yeah. of Cassandra though. He's like <laughs> sitting in his apartment, just like imagining, like maybe he just smoked too much weed and is like paranoid and he's like, the world is collapsing and everything's going to be bad and the robots are going to take okay. over and blah, blah, blah. All right. I'm going to finish the train of thought I was on sorry, and sorry, sorry. then we're going to talk about, uh, 
future. Okay, okay. I'm just like, I guess I'm like rearranging on that one because I, 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 okay, sorry. sorry. No, I was just, the train I I was saying though that I thought um, from before was that they had these three ideologies of fascism, communism, and liberalism. Yeah, yeah. And then fascism for all intents and purposes dies, although I agree with you that tenets of it are going to make a resurgence as eugenics becomes more and more like, uh, like as a scientific normalized. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Um, And then, it was a battle between communism and liberalism and communism lost. So like mm-hmm. the idea I guess was, um, wait, 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 it's oh. like communism lost, but it also didn't. Cause like we frame everything the, in like the way of Marx still. Uh, no. Uh, well, it kind of did though. Right. So like the thing that, so what's so interesting is that he, um, so he says that, okay, these things are religions. They're, they're like just the new shared mythology. It's like they, they serve the same purpose. You might not call it God, but it is a God. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. you worship li- liberalism right. or you worship communism. So like they were competing for like the global order. And in that sense, I do feel like communism did lose because like, you know, every communist country collapsed. And like the whole idea was that, so I get, okay, so I'll finish the train because then okay, okay. we can talk back into the discussion. He's like, okay, um, liberalism became the new thing, right? Like, and like, there's this famous book by Francis Fukuyama called the end of history where he says, okay, like we had three ideologies, two of them died. Now it's liberalism. This is the end, like this mm-hmm. one. And like, we're kind of at a point now where liberalism is collapsing because mm. people just think of it kind of as a scam, which yeah. is, I think there's truth to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where it's like, well, you know, all these people, um, you know, CEOs of major banks did really shady shit and crashed the economy. And then you just bailed them out. And then nominated someone for president that gives these private speeches to them and like right, right. offloaded it to the taxpayer. Like this whole thing sounds like a real yeah. big scam to us. Or like uh, copy democracy in like uh, in Iraq and that will work. And it's like if China doesn't practice democracy, it's because they're like they're like yeah. on the wrong side of history and they're just going to collapse. It's like now no one thinks this. So. Yeah. So it's like now there's we're kind of down to zero ideologies and that's why there's kind of like, like there's, there's this collapse. But he posits that there's two things that or, or like probably even more, but there's two that stuck out to me okay. where he's positing like these are the two things that can replace, like will be the new shared ideology. So the first one that he talks about is growth, which I think is really interesting. So he's just like, like I guess you can call it capitalism, but mm-hmm. I think it's like more abstract than that where it's like just this idea of growth, which is like growing things to be better. Like he talks about like how in Singapore, um, the GDP uh, like, tied to government ministers' yeah, salaries. The yeah, government yeah. Uh, minister's salary is tied to the GDP. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like literally your government gets paid based on growth metrics. Mm-hmm. And like we have like Deng Xiaoping in China basically skirted Marxism because he was pursuing growth. Where he he like said, Okay, we wanna, you know, follow communist ideas, but like we're growing this economy. And if that clashes with Marx, I'm sorry, Marx, you know? Yeah, it's like he doesn't care if a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. Yeah. And it was like the idea of communism is that you achieve growth maximally through central state planning. Oh and like what? and like it lost to capitalism, right? Like capitalism was you achieve growth through organic um business processes and free markets and like it seems like that is better for growth so that's what i mean by like communism lost to liberalism is like even if you like idolize growth as a religion it's not through central state planning that that emerges it's like the more natural forces okay fine but that's like only one element of like oh i was gonna say also though um like i feel like in silicon valley we have this weird um, mythology around growth also well it's not weird it's just like like there's like a famous Paul Graham essay where he says like startup equals growth. Like mm-hmm. that's what a startup is. It's growth. Like, are you growing? Then you're a good startup. Are you not growing? Then you're not a good startup. Like it's just, and like, that's just so, that is like a new, one of these mythologies. And, and I think that that's one of the things that gets tied into the Homo Deus book when he starts talking about AI is that if people really do worship growth as this new collective mythology, like, okay, well now you're just going to grow these like sentient AI systems and like grow, 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 grow. grow and they're, it's going to be real bad. Like, uh, yeah, but anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So my idea is that like how to like produce growth or like produce resources is only one tenant of like the idea of Marx. And so like one of the ideas of Marx that like lives on is like, it's so interesting. It's like, so although like the idea Although, like, Marxism is dead and communism doesn't exist, it, like, changed our discourse and our way of conceiving history. Whereas, like, now we see everything in terms of, like, class and, like, w- like even politicians. He, like, used this really amazing thing, which is, like, like, so they see everything in, like, terms of the economy. And, like, before that, like, wasn't even really a word. And, like, the proletariat and stuff like this. And so it's, like, in the election where like 
after the Soviet Union collapsed, then like Bill Clinton defeated George W. Bush, and his campaign slogan was "It's the economy, stupid," which yeah. is so f- interesting because it's like Marx like formulated this idea of like you know what I mean like like these kind of like class struggle and like the economy and something like this. It's so fascinating that it's like so although like the way that he conceived of history didn't like manifest itself because history is like an adaptive thing that like uh yeah i'll know her are used this like really interesting line to me which was that yeah marx wrote this book and it was totally accurate and like history probably would have proceeded in that way but marx forgot one thing which is that capitalists can read <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, and that, then, that's I, a good point. But, like, the thing also with, like, what you were saying about growth, I thought another thing was so interesting was that he was saying that, um, yeah, so, like, anyway, I think that, like, capitalism, like, incorporated the ideas of Marx and, like, changed and adapted. But anyway, so, and, like, took in, so now we have, like, a thing that absorbed those ideas, too, in some sense. But anyway, the thing about, like, animals and, like, foxes, like, if foxes live in a valley and there's, like, like every, there's, like, how to say, like, 100 rabbits and there's, like, 10 foxes and then, like, the there's like every year like some x number of rabbits are like too stupid or fat or old so like they get eaten by foxes and then it's like if the foxes had a board meeting they're like okay we're gonna like increase our like consumption of rabbits by three percent next year and like how are we gonna do this and like blah 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 they like formulate a plan and then like they eat three percent more rabbits next year then it's like after like some certain time they'd like hit the rate at which like they can't make any more rabbits like there's a hard limit on like the number of rabbits that you can make so like foxes can't like you know what i mean formulate some growth strategy to like multiply their like tribe of foxes which is just some i don't know funny anecdote that was from one of his other books <laughs> that i think of when you were saying the thing about growth uh, that yeah um <laughs> the other thing i was gonna say so that that's one of the things that my like interpretation of these books is like he's saying this is something that's going to replace the relentless pursuit of growth Mm -hmm. um and that i guess like there's obviously challenges to that like climate change is the big one and he does a really good riff on that where it's like well now we have global problems with national politics and it's like not good Mm -hmm. because if nation states are competing in pursuit of growth or like economic growth or whatever um obviously global problems and tragedy of the commons problems aren't going to get solved although he does say that he can foresee one of these countries because this is really interesting that are going to have real big climate change issues where like they're about to like get drowned if they don't figure something out in 20 years have like these manhattan manhattan project oh, yeah. style like yeah, yeah, yeah. innovation fests where they're like oh man we're gonna die if we don't like literally innovate our way yeah, out so of this it's like balls to the wall throw all the money at research yeah. and just like yeah and you might actually have like baller solutions yeah. like come out of this like totally. pressure that comes yeah. under them um oh and this is also interesting too because he said like in a sense like science um has become a new religion for some people where they think that you can just like science your way out of any problem of society. Mm -hmm. And this is like a really big point of contention um, as again, like liberalism decays. And now it's about like, what's going to replace this as like the shared myth. Like, yeah, we could become like this super like, you know, Spock, like rationalist um, society, but it's possible. Like he uses this, like he's like science. um, What does he say? It's such a good line. He's like, Science is really good if you want to be truthful, but have like decayed social institutions and like lies are really good if you want Mm. to not find the truth, but you want to have like a lot of social cohesion. So like he doesn't think that like, I I mean, I read it as he does not believe that science can be like a tool of social cohesion um, just because it just doesn't tell a good enough narrative. It's like, yeah, your life means nothing. You're just stardust. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, it like doesn't have that narrative. It's like your sacrifice probably was in vain. It's probably cause you did something silly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, it's like the yeah. people traded power for meaning in their lives. Like that's the trade off yeah. of modernity that like before we had, like if something bad happened to you, it'd be like, yeah, but so this bad thing, like having like my friend died, but it's like part of God's greater plan. So like blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But then it's like, if, uh, now in our modern age if it's like if somebody dies it's like yep they just died so like whatever deal with it dude yeah and then it's like and it's gonna lead to nihilism yeah, and yeah, it yeah. does lead to nihilism and i think you see that a lot like that's why people are so addicted to like video games and like drugs and stuff um yo also he uses a line that thinks really good where he talks about like you can't you can't um like you can not uh or it's it's up for grabs whether or not you can um debate ethical questions with like scientific reasoning which i thought was really interesting so he says like he uses this example Mm -hmm. where he's like okay like america is um has like a supreme place in the world like this is like a moral question it's not really a factual question Mm -hmm. but then you could like bring that down one level of abstraction and be like 
Well, we're saying that America spearheaded most of the technological innovation of the, you know, 20th century. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, that's a question you can debate, like, with reason and logic and facts and science. Mm -hmm. But can you, can you debate the ethical abstraction you made on top of that with science specifically? And that's, like, a huge question that he has is, like, um, can, you can bring things down to a scientific level and debate it, but can you debate the, like, abstraction on top? And, like, that's... I watch, like, people on YouTube argue about this stuff all the time, which is kind of interesting, but... Yeah, but the fetus one, that was really good, too. Which one was that? that? like... So science can tell you, like, when exactly a fetus gets, like, a spinal cord, but it can't tell you, like, when it has consciousness or when it has life or, like, whatever. Like, when it's okay uh, to, like, abort this fetus or whatever. It's like a moral this, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So science can tell you facts, but it can't tell you ethics. Yeah, interesting. I, I think that's very much up for debate, and it will be one of the big debates that, like, people start going on. It's like whether or not you can solve ethical questions of science. You know, so the other thing that he was saying, um, which it could be a religion, like, kind of, is, like, this idea of dataism, which I oh, thought yeah. was so interesting. So it's, like, this this worship of data, right? And it, it it's, like, okay, we worship, like, our algorithms almost. Yeah, but this is also related to Marxism. So this was so fascinating, and I really liked that he said this. It's, like totally hegelian and marxist where he was like yeah uh humanism is our new religion where it's just like follow your heart and blah 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 but this contains the seeds of its own destruction where it's like okay so yeah do whatever you want but do you really know what you want and that gets into the thing of like um like young which is like you can do whatever you want but you cannot want whatever you want and so uh. he i think he uses the example of like homosexuality a lot because i guess like the author of this book is homosexual and he was like yeah if i want to like like, I don't know, have sex with some dude, I can do that or not do that. But I didn't, like, choose to want to do that. It's just, like, I wanted to do that. And so it's, like, nowadays we have, like, these algorithms that, like, in some sense know more about you than you know about you. And so it's, yeah. like, if you have an algorithm that's, like, telling you, like, what to do or whatever, then it's, like, like whom to marry or, like, what video to watch or, like, yeah. movie to watch, yeah. Then it's, like, uh, if it knows you better than you know yourself, then, like, you should just give the control to that. So it's, like, we have the thing, like, humanism is, like, do what people want and, like, value people because, like, they're, like, the ultimate source of truth in the universe and they give meaning to the events of the universe because there's no meaning of God or anything like this. But it, like, contains the seeds of its own destruction because by following that, then you're, like, yeah. And then, like, we do whatever people want to do, but, like, since algorithms know better than what people... That, like yeah no better than people what they want so just follow algorithms and all the data and like so that's so beautiful that's such a great idea and i think it's so right and like that was a genius insight so w one of the interesting things that comes out of this and he also talks about like but it also like degrades society right because uh, he's talking about like okay in like the 50s or whatever like we'd have propaganda posters that like show like a coal miner and it's like this is you know the Amer uh, might oh, the yeah. might of the american economy right yeah, and like they're on posters and it like there was like social gravitas to like yeah. being involved in this and it's like now all our propaganda is about like algorithms it's like <laughs> facebook's new algorithm will like show you new like it's like the things that we worship and the things that people give ted talks about are like these abstract technical concepts mm -hmm. that are like it's like very clear that like if you live in like west virginia it's like this is not you I know, like, I know. no one's giving a TED talk about you. Like, that's not yeah. the thing that's being, like, worshipped mythologically, um, which I think is really interesting because I think it does degrade society, right? Because it, it just basically tells people, like, hey, like, these are the things that we care about, but it's not human beings. And it's does not... it, though? Because it's, like, so in... This was fascinating, too, because it's, like, what Marx was talking about was that, like, the proletariat, it, like, had all this immense power because, like, the economy needed them and, like to have like a functional factory you need many workers that just turn widgets mm -hmm. and to have a functional army you need many soldiers and so it's like when they had like this posters of, like glorious soldiers or glorious workers then like a dumb guy on like on the street like joe schmo could like walk by that poster and see himself reflected in that poster but now in like our modern age like this is not relevant anymore because like the modern economy doesn't need just so many workers and the modern army doesn't need so many soldiers it could just do everything with drones or we could do everything by like automation so it's like they just are becoming like more and more irrelevant somehow and then it's so fascinating because i'm always wondering like when i will become irrelevant yeah um i'm gonna finish this thought and then i'm gonna ask you about the obvious follow-up to this which okay, okay. is about the singularity so okay let okay. me get that i just want to finish through the thought so the other thing he said about data and that's interesting is like it might lead to taxes on information which i think is really cool like idea just like hey if like what is if, if data isn't becomes this religion and this like really powerful thing like data and information are like the scarce resources. So like we might change our taxation systems where it's like you have information taxes and things like that, mm -hmm. like for consumption, which is fascinating. Oh, and he also says that 
this is one of the reasons why liberalism might be dead or like might lose is that if you have dataism where like the only thing that matters is like how good your ai systems are and your algorithms like then centralized systems are actually better at this because like like for example like the chinese government would be way better at making a general ai about their country than the u.s government where like you have like data is so siloed in so many different companies. Yeah. Whereas in China, it's all like aggregated in one place. It's like that's actually an advantage in the data dataism world. You totally. Know? Um, which is so fascinating idea. Like it might lose like for some things, but if we go towards like AI, like AI is going to be better. The more better data set it has, the cleaner data set will always be the one centralized company where it's all in one server and they can iterate on it. All right, cool. So going back to what I was saying, yeah, I wanted to ask you this: Do you believe in the singularity? So like, I, I should just say like the, the idea is that. Um, AI will take everyone's jobs. People will not have anything to do with their lives to contribute to the economy. You'll have to get like something like universal basic income to like sustain people. Like, do you believe that this is a thing that's going to happen? Um, I don't like Ray Kurzweil's books. And so I don't like the word singularity, <laughs> but like, yeah, I think that that's going to happen. But like what you were just saying before that, which I thought was like interesting is like that, uh, like yeah so there's like this reminds me of a peter Thiel talk which was so just killer that he gave at this university or something in hungary recently or like in austria which was that so there's two competing forces in the modern world there's like the centralization one which is like ai and then there's like the decentralization one which is like blockchain and eth so and he was just talking about them and it was like two competing camps and like exactly as you were saying that like centralized systems as like more kind of like yeah the ai approach to everything but then there's like also the distributed like decentralized way which is the kind of crypto way and i guess right they're like at odds with each other yeah totally they totally are yeah and yeah. cryptocurrency or like just cryptography in general is kind of like the nuclear bomb against um like centralized oh yo, this is so okay I, i'll hash that idea but i, I was gonna say um oh man he said this was so interesting but he's like okay so like we basically have like very um, well thought out frameworks for like regulating ownership of um, like things like land. It's like we have property rights and that's well thought out. And it's like regulating ownership of industry is well thought out, like mm -hmm. with equity ownership and, and stocks and stuff like this. But like equity ownership or like regulation on ownership of data is just the wild west. Like there's no framework for thinking about it whatsoever. But yeah, so if, if data is going to be the fuel of these like new AI systems, right? So things like cryptocurrency are like, or I'm not even cryptocurrencies, just cryptography are like powerful weapons because they're like these systems that are uh, asymmetric towards the, you know, person having it against the person that wants it. Yeah, yeah. Um, where in, in that sense, like encrypting something takes like one second and then it would take like a million years to decrypt it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's like the, the, like the amount of work it takes to encrypt something so that it's not useful for whatever system wants that data is just so minimal compared to the amount of work it takes to reverse engineer that, that that asymmetry just leads to like, that's such a weapon. Yeah. And I think that's why like governments are so anti-encryption is like the, the, the weapon itself is so powerful. So we have like this movement where people want like encryption everywhere. They want data privacy. They want siloed data. The, the question of where data and identity, like I, going tying back to the very beginning of this podcast, where that's going to live is, is like up for grabs. It's like unknown if it's going to live in Facebook centralized server unencrypted or like local in your browser, you know, like um, completely yeah. encrypted and not viewable for anyone that you don't share the, you know, the key, the encryption key with. Um, or and something that, in between. Yeah, or something in between. And Europe is like, so this data privacy thing that Europe is doing, it's like the idea that like, there it's like pre-written and then like this baidu and like chinese way or like google's way is like absolutely going to win it's like not that certain yeah it's it, it's not clear what's going to win and that's what makes like we're like thinking about this stuff i guess so exciting is that it's kind of uncertain um yo but yeah so so um my thought is that i do believe in the singularity like personally um just because and he talks and like a lot about this, um, like the, the, all of like Homo Deus is basically about this. Yeah. Homo Deus, Homo Deus. I'm going to go with Homo Deus. Um, yo, so, so like, for example, like take the example of chess, right? Mm -hmm. So, oh my God. So you can look this up on YouTube, but like, uh, so there was this chess engine called Stockfish, which is like the most powerful Stockfish 8 at the time uh, of like last year was the most powerful chess engine in the world. Like it, it's significantly better than any human. It would never lose against a human player. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Google made this chess engine called Alpha Zero um, that was going to use a different technique where it wasn't, it was just going to be completely um, through uh, reinforcement learning and neural networks. 
um, and have no like database of any chess games pre-written into it is just going to play itself billions of times and like really quickly figure out like what the best strategies were. And it played against Stockfish 8 like last year in like it was 72 game series or something. And it won 28 of the games and it tied 56 of them and lost zero of them. And like you can go on YouTube and look at these games. They're amazing. <laughs> oh my God. Like watching like some dude like chess YouTuber talk about the Alpha Zero games mm. is just unbelievable. Like it's unbelievable how brilliant the system was at playing chess. Mm. And he's talking about like things like, okay, like creativity. It's like, yeah, well, you know, robots can do your taxes, but you know, can they be creative? He's like, okay, they, we already associate creativity with robots in chess. It's like if you're playing chess online and you make a move that's brilliant, it's like so creative and like that you, no one would think to do it, but it like ties itself together. The natural assumption is like, oh, you're using a chess engine. You know, like mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. like we already associate the idea of creativity with ch like machines in chess. Yep. Um, okay, so that's like super structured. Like what about like music, right? Well, okay, so I've been learning to play music for the last two years and like I have no doubt in my fucking mind that robots will make better music than humans. And he even uses this analogy in the book where like he talks like all these guys that were, or I guess he's just citing a study, but like someone did this study where they talked to all these like music nerds that were like, oh, Bach is so classically, the way he like weaves things together is brilliant. You could never like code this in AI. And like someone like hacked together like an algorithm to make classical music. And then they like played it and like asked them which one was Bach and like which one was the music and I couldn't tell. And then they asked them like which one was more like brilliant and creative and they picked the robots music. Yeah, and yeah, it's like, yeah. like, like, I don't know. Like I, I just see things like that. And it, I, I really believe that <laughs> like, yeah, there, there's going to be, and it's also like, this is kind of silly, I guess, but just from my own personal experience of like what people I know like do for a living and like, um, just where like the trajectory of the world is going, it's just, it's just gonna really leave a lot of people out of the out of the loop. Yeah, that, that's, that's true though. But so I was always thinking while I was listening to this book, um, what is going to be my role in this like situation, and like how long is it gonna take? So he's talking about the f time when people's jobs become irrelevant and redundant, and then they just become useless to the economy, and they'll have to reinvent themselves. But so I'm a software engineer, and I wonder how long it will be before AI programs can write software programs. I guess it will be so long because, like, I yeah. mean, I used to study uh, artificial intelligence, and I just, like, having some kind of making a move in chess or, like, j even, like, arranging some song is, like, you know, because, like, music is a little bit random, yeah? It's, like... So, I remember I bought this thing, which was, um... This hand-controlled... Like, it was, a uh, Something that can see the movement of your hand and then map it into your computer. So you oh, can, leap like, motion? Yeah, leap motion. I bought yeah. this leap motion. And it's, like, really good for making, like, um... Like, weird music that's, like, whale noises and stuff. But it's not precise enough to make actual cool music so it's like sort of useless but i guess like his whole point is that all of this stuff is like trending towards yeah and it's not he makes another point that i thought was interesting which is okay it might not just be that ai like takes everyone's jobs it might just be that like it really changes the nature of what work is and like there's new industries that emerge but that volatility is just gonna like run up against the like mental stress levels that most people can tolerate where it's like if industries are just getting flipped every five years and like you have to like really hustle to keep up, that's going to just like naturally leave a lot of people behind. Mm -hmm. Cause it's like, you could just be an accountant or a lawyer for like at any time, like basically in the last hundred years, you know, where it's like, Oh, if I just want to settle down and go to law school, you could do it. And there's, you could be a lawyer or like, I want to settle down and be an accountant. That's a thing. But like if jobs are just changing all the time and you have to like, just be on the like guard to even catch up to it, it's just the volatility itself might just be, you know, um, because because I believe there will be new jobs, right? Like gene editor is going to be a blue collar job. Like what mm -hmm. we think of working on a factory is going to be some dude with a computer and like a laser machine, like editing genes. You know, like there mm -hmm. will be like transitions to new industries. Like computer programmer wasn't even a thing fifty years ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the volatility is just going to be raucous, I think, and that that leads to the questions. And he like again, he doesn't answer any of these. He just like causes the questions where he's like, okay, like things like UBI, like is universal basic income a valid solution to this? I lean towards like I, I really believe also that he leans towards no having reading these books because the whole point is like he talks so much about that idea of uh, personal narrative and collective mythology yeah and he's just like 
okay, if you just sit and play VR games all day because they're really good and get paid by the government and don't have to work because you're useless in the workforce, like, are you even a human anymore? Are you even, like, experiencing human emotions? Or, like, are you just, like, some blob that's just, like, consuming shit and, like, doing drugs, you know? like Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, that seems like that would be the natural, uh, like, le- like, end game of UBI, right? Yeah. I really thought it was interesting. He was like, oh, yeah, well, like, humans will be necessary as uh, consumers. But then he was talking about how some kind of company that was, like, totally controlled by AI and robots that does mining could just, like, be engaged. Or, like, the mining company could be involved with the company that makes robots for mining. And they could, like, generate profits and then pay that other company. And it's just, like... It's already happening with like algorithms that are like trading algorithms that trade against other trading algorithms yeah. and they like buy and sell to each other. So it's like a whole economy that's just existing without humans. Dude, I thought this idea was dope when he was talking about um, can you sue an algorithm? Like if that's going to be like a thing in the future. Oh, yeah. Because like if algorithms like own venture capital funds, which is like going to be a thing. And he's like, if algorithms are like making decisions in your daily life, like will like they be treated as like entities that you can sue? Oh, it's an awesome question. Yeah. And also, so. I think a lot of the stuff, though, with especially self-driving cars that, like, crash into pedestrians or whatever or, like, kill their driver um, when push comes to shove is just a question that I've thought about a lot. And I guess it's kind of, to me, banal at this point. But I guess that this book is kind of, like, someone trying to present all of these questions. Yeah. And I guess maybe a lot of people haven't thought about this i don't know do you know what else was kind of interesting that he was saying um on this theme was that okay so like we have these ideas of like things that are considered like old school ideas like intelligent design mm-hmm. whereas like well i guess that's kind of off top i would say the thing but it's like it's like, okay, like if you look at like israel um like you have like a really large orthodox community which like they just like sit and pray oh, yeah, and they're like they're like rabbis all day yeah yeah and then you have like a working and they don't work and don't pay taxes yeah they something. don't yeah, work yeah. and they don't pay taxes and you have like a working community yeah that like works like nine to five like normal contributes to the economy and yeah, they yeah, yeah. hate the orthodox community because they're just like leechers they see it as right where it's like well they're not working they just like leech off the state yeah but the orthodox community like polls gen- even though they're not working like when you poll them about their happiness the orthodox community like always says that they're happier yeah um and it's like we think of that as like archaic but he posits that that might actually be like futuristic. Yeah, like the model for universal basic yeah. income. He's like, well, actually, the Orthodox community might be what we're all doing, which yeah. is just like not working and like needing to find meaning in like yeah, other yeah. things. So like maybe that's actually the things that we think of as the past or like the actual model for the future. And he also like talks about this with intelligent design. Where he's like, intelligent design is this idea that um, God like guided human evolution like through strategic implementation of detail and like we're like oh intelligent design that's so discredited and it's like well literally that's the future of humanity (laughs) is like we already do it with like animals where it's like we make cows and chickens like intelligently designed to like supply produce more milk yeah exactly um and we're gonna start doing it to ourselves like Mm -hmm. as we get like more Mm cyborgy where it's like well, you know, I do want better vision. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> get my right eye. So I'll get LASIK. We yeah. already do it. Yeah, it's like this literally is just intel- like this idea that's discredited of intelligent design is like what we're doing. And like that's going to become more and more of a thing. And it's also interesting that the way that he talks about it a lot, which in a way that resonated with me, was that it's going to really accelerate um, expanding inequality. Mm-hmm. Because it's like, okay, right now, like, people are generally equal like in their abilities like some people have higher iqs some people have like better bodies some people are richer but like the playing field's kind of the same but if like you can literally just buy beauty wet like beauty smarts and like physical enhancements yeah then it's literally just going to accelerate this inequality like we're like tech titans and like russian oligarchs grandkids are just going to be immortal gods you know yeah yeah totally and like normal people that was interesting right yeah he said like that the aristocracy in the past had always been like saying that they're like smarter and like more moral and like more beautiful and blah 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 than like the workers and peasants but it had been a lie but then what about like till now like when you can like actually like design like i don't know get new ears that like have headphones attached to them and like all kinds of crazy stuff then it's like it will actually become true and then it's like oh my god yeah and dude i notice this all the time like oh my god fucking stanford university just scares the crap out of me because it's just like it's just expanding massively and it's like aggregates all people that are into like they're like rich and into technology and like Palo Alto is becoming like a walled off city 
like so is like the google campus and the facebook campus and like these things are just gonna eventually just like have walls and fortifications and guns pointed at like outside of it and like interesting this is where like it just like stanford to me seems like the nat like it's going in the direction where it's like people that are going to start doing cyborg stuff are just all going to aggregate in palo alto and like wall themselves off (laughs) the rest (laughs) of society like elysium or something like this yeah (laughs) Yeah. maybe i I don't know i I, like noticed that trying to have any oh yo okay so another a lot of the like uh the second book in this series he talks about like and like not just um like doing cyborg stuff but he talks about like the human brain a lot in a way that Mm -hmm. i found to be really interesting um like all these experiments that people are already doing um no, it's just so fascinating. Also, like, the guy loves animals. He's so into mammals. Like, and just like that cows and chickens have feelings too. Yeah, Which yeah. is so interesting. Because like, I was a vegan for a while, but actually just like as a science experiment to like see what it did to my body. But I feel like this guy must be a vegan and, or like at least a vegetarian. Oh, just the way that he speaks about yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like yeah. the Interesting. Because, oh, it was so fascinating. Because I had never even really thought about it in this way. That like cows and pigs like, you know, have like feelings and stuff that are like when you like separate a cow from its like calves and then just like artificially inseminated and keep it in like a very small crate and just like do that over and over and over and over like how insane that is for like uh just like totally blatantly disregarding like the feelings and emotions of like this mammal that like it's just fascinating like industrial farming like that is just really crazy yeah and i don't ever think about it and i don't want to yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my strategy <laughs> Um, yeah, so check this out. So he, he talks about this idea of collective consciousness. I know I just skirted that conversation. <laughs> I just don't want to deal with it. I like eating steak too much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> some people like, I agree with you in principle, but I just like, I literally just delete it from my brain. It's too much to deal with. I got enough problems. Yeah. I guess I just like, I mean, yeah. since I started eating meat, I feel much healthier and, or like I w- started like just getting hurt less and stuff like that. Yeah think it would be cool to not eat meat if like i had a personal chef and a nutritionist yeah interesting um <laughs> once they grow it in a lab i'll switch like if you just make good artificial meat i'll just switch to it like i, I don't have any like quandary with that it's just it needs to taste better yeah although apparently there's this thing in new york called the impossible burger which oh, yeah, is like it. is it good it's okay all right i need to taste that so we'll see but uh we'll see where we're at <laughs> <laughs> but um yo he had this idea of when he's talking he goes on this whole like eight chapters about the human brain or something um he has idea like i'm just gonna like just say random things i thought were interesting so he has this idea of collective consciousness which i think is really interesting which is like and like elon musk just talked about this because he has this company Neuralink, where he basically says like the problem with um like uh like this idea of like enhancing the human brain is the bandwidth issue where you can only get like data in really slowly and data out really slowly, but we don't have high bandwidth connections where like you can get your data out mm. like mass, like really, really quick per second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he's like phones basically are like, you know, external memory for your brain. Like it's like, if you enhance the memory storage of your brain, it's like phones are amazing, right? Like they can take a picture of something and like, remember it perfectly mm-hmm. forever. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Like our brains can't do this, yeah. but like the bandwidth is really slow where it's like, you have to like go use your fingers and like get up to the phone and like, pull up the picture and then like look at it or if you could just like upload that in a millisecond that exact image to your brain like it, it's not like a technology problem it's a bandwidth problem right so he has this idea of like collective consciousness where like i could just like look at your memories but like as if they were my own memories where like i just have a high bandwidth connection to the memory storage of your brain hmm. and then you can make like botnets where like people like all share from the same memory pool mm-hmm. but like have their own individual processing on it but like they just share their memories oh that shit like trips me out so much but it's so interesting yeah but it's also related to this carl young book that i was reading just recently as well which is that like there already is a kind of collective conscious that we all have and that he uses this to interpret people's dreams that like there's some uh, kind of things that everyone just associates i guess like maybe it's kind of culturally dependent but like at least in the west with like i don't know like trees or like bridges or just like there's just symbols like, that everyone just it just kind of has similar ideas about like that these things mean or represent other things that's really interesting yeah yeah i, I gotta read more young that's we'll definitely cover like that at some point in this uh, podcast. Yo, also another one that I thought was interesting. So he talks about this thing called like a robo rat, which is like, it's a rat, but like, okay. So he, he uses this example. Like there's an experiment someone did where like they had their brain like hooked up to like some MRI machine and they have a button in their left hand and a right hand. And they're like, 
all right, just like at any random time, press either the left button or the right button and just do it as many times as you want whenever you want. And like they are looking at their brain images as they're like going to press these buttons. And like eventually once they do it enough, like you can figure out like where in their brain they send the signal. Like it's like, oh, like we know what it looks like when he's about to press the left button. And like we get that signal before he presses it. So like the scientists could then like figure out and guess which button you're going to press before the person actually presses it. And like before they even know that they want to press it, it's like the decision to press the left or right button was actually made before they actually pressed it. Mm -hmm. And then they did this in like with rats where they hooked something into their brain to control that. So like they would like go to a maze and go like left or right. And the scientists could steer the rat by like sending that like signal to their brain. Like, Hey, this is what it means when you want to turn left. But from the rat's perspective, the rat made the decision to turn left because it's like, what is making a decision? It's like when those neurons fire in a very specific way, but the, there was actually like scientists could manipulate the way those neurons fire. And oh, man, that just really messed with me when I was reading this. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> you can reprogram yeah, people, yeah. but like in a way where like they come to the conclusion themselves and then like what that means. And yeah, this is what I mean by these books were trippy when I said this at the beginning of the podcast. Yeah, they definitely are. But every <sighs> good book is trippy in some way because it's like, just implants different ways of viewing the world and thinking about your life and everything. Yeah. I mean, it's not like as I guess this book is not as mind blowing as like Das Kapital was. I don't think that people are going to like be. Yeah, because maybe so maybe like this book is like the guy is good at identifying like how the world works for now and like thinking about like, well, even he's not. He's like he was good at like assessing like how, what's human history and like where it got us to and then maybe projecting into the future but like where this guy is like totally not on the caliber of like marx is like because marx was like all right this is how history works this is how modernity works this is the problem this is the solution this guy was like okay well, this is how history works yeah this is how modernity works and like the future could be like this. Isn't it so scary? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, yeah. Nice. But, but isn't that then the example of like the, the lie being better for like social organization, but not being right, which is basically Marx's writings is like, he told a better narrative. Oh, yo, that reminds me. That's a, another point that he made in this book. That's so good. It's at the very end of the, uh, the 21 lessons book where he talks about um, this idea of the explaining self versus the narrating self mm. or like the experience, I'm sorry, the experiencing self versus the narrating self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so fascinating. So he's like, you have two selves. Like there's the self of you that experiences things and then there's the self of you that like draw, creates the narratives for these things. Yeah. And there was some experiment that they did where like they'd put someone's hand in like really, really cold water for like 15 oh, seconds. Oh yeah, I love it. That's for really like 15 term. seconds. And then like they'd put it in really, really co cold water for 15 seconds and then like slightly warm the water up mm -hmm. for like... Um, so like their hand was experiencing more pain because it's in the water for longer. Yeah. But the pain got slightly better over time, even though the badness of it was the, at the same time. So like, he, and then they asked people which they prefer and like unanimously or like overwhelmingly, they preferred the second experience. So like, even though there was more total pain given in that experience, people liked it because the narrative that they told themselves was that it got better over time where the other one was yeah. just really bad. Yeah. And like that was a thing with like colonoscopies also, which are like super painful procedures where like if the thing is really painful for the same amount of time, but then like it gets slowly better, like people always prefer the second experience. And he says that there's this idea that the experiencing self aggregates. So like it just looks at each frame and it's like, where's my pain there? Like, where's my pain there? Where's my pain? And it sums it. And it's like, mm -hmm. that's how I feel pain. But the narrating self averages. So it like looks at things and then looks at the trend and then interprets things this way. Mm -hmm. um, man. And like, they can actually use this um, in like in medical procedures to like make people think the procedure is better. And like, in elections. What do you mean? This oh. was so interesting, right? He was like talking about how you could have an algorithm vote for you, which would actually know your preferences better than you would. This is like about algorithms knowing you better than you know yourself. Because it's like, yeah, you complain about like this horrible prime minister that we have and how he's like ruining the country all the time. But like right before like the election, like a few months before they like make a tax cut and then they like do a bunch of things that are like slightly like into the thing that you want. And then it's like, oh, yeah. And you like wake up with a cold and you also like prefer security. So it looks like when you actually get into the voting booth, you vote yeah. to keep this 
bastard in office, although you hate him. Because it's like, you know, like they did the same thing. It's like it was a bad experience, but it got a little bit better at the end. So it's like you remember just the end. Yeah. Yeah. The narrative you tell you is, yeah, is yeah, that yeah. it's turning better. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not like what's going to minimize my pain or right, whatever. Right, right. So an algorithm could do better. Yeah. That's such an interesting idea. But uh, but I, I he, he ties this into like meditation at the end of the third book. Um, because it's that, that idea of figuring out how to, like, control the narrating self oh, yeah. and, like, tell yourself. But that, I, oh, man, that idea is so accurate. It's, like, people do create myths for themselves. And he basically says you can make people believe anything you want to believe, mm-hmm. um, especially if it benefits them. That was another thing. I'm 100% into the idea of, like, narrative self. I just love it. Like, I've been obsessed with this idea for, like, months now. And it's, like, so my favorite, like, book on this subject is that, um, what the hell is it called? It's by Joseph Campbell the hero with a thousand faces it's called and it's about how like he traveled all around the world and like compared different myths and like yeah i'll know her did this as well where he like compared harry potter to the bible and he was like maybe some people would be offended by that but like the thing is harry potter and the bible are the same okay. harry potter is the same as the bible is the same as like lord of the rings is the same as like every creation myth of every like human tribe like all around the world they're all the same and it's like we also have like this like hero narrative that we tell ourselves about ourselves and it's really obvious when you like you meet a person for the first time and they're like okay who are you like what do you do and you're like okay i'm this person and like i do this because i did that and before i did this and this and this and this is like my little blurb that i give you about my life and i can't tell you everything about my life because it's like i just know you for a short time but i have to explain some context and so it's like the context that you tell to that person should be a story that's inspiring to you and should be a story that's inspiring to them and this is like your own little hero narrative that you're like living out every single day of your life and i'm just fascinated by this I'm like consciously thinking about how to improve my hero narrative. Oh, interesting. Yeah. All right, cool, man. Um, so I think I want to do like a quick lightning round because I have just some okay, random, I just have some random notes written down of just things that have no follow up to them. I just yeah, thought yeah, they were yeah. interesting. Carved out his book. So I'm just going to like look, I'm just going to look through this right now and see if anything that we haven't talked about I thought was interesting. Sounds good. Oh, okay. So here's one, one interesting thought. Okay. He talks about when he's talking in Sapiens um, about like how every society around the world constructed um, their societies around different hierarchies. Like some hierarchies, like India, they have this thing like a caste system, right? Which is like something that doesn't exist in the West. Yeah. But we have like a class system. Yep. And like we had racial hierarchy for a while where like some races were considered superior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like every culture made different hierarchies except for patriarchy. Like every oh, yeah, single culture, had yeah. had, like men were better than women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is so interesting. And like yeah. he's like, I don't know why this is. Uh, I'm not saying anything. He's just like, I thought it was interesting. Yeah. Um, he also said that yeah. Eve in Semitic languages means snake. Is huh. that true? Not like what's this like Arabic? I get oh, it's and Hebrew as well, right? It's definitely not Eve, but huh? It but could, maybe it's it could be derived like from that. Really. I know it starts with an I and it's like, it's like oh, that. Interesting. Ash, it's something like this. Uh, <laughs> because he was saying as well yeah. that this is the only animist story in the entire Bible and the entire Torah is like when like there's this like evil snake that like tricks humanity. It's like the only talking animal in the whole thing is like this super evil one. I think it's like Ashara. It's something like, it like could be derived from Eve. It's like close enough, I, I, but it's definitely not. There's also no V in Arabic. So that's another thing. But uh, all right, cool. I thought that was interesting. Uh, Blah, 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 blah. Oh, yo, I thought this was interesting, too. Uh, talking about brain stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he said, we have bionic arms right now where, like, they can look at the neurons in your head and they can predict how you want to move it and it moves the bionic arm, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. But what it can't do is bidirectional where, like, when you feel something, it can figure Ooh. out how to send the neuron back. But, like, they're really close to being able to do this. That's interesting. So, like, we're going to have, like, two-way bionic arms really soon. I thought that was really cool. Huh, oh, yo, cool. I thought this was interesting. Uh, when, speaking of digital identity, he says that your DNA, like there might be online services that like require you to like upload your DNA to like use them. That's kind of interesting. Like using. He said something as well that they like they started using 23andMe in like criminal investigations now. Yeah. Which is fascinating. It's a little I scary. I don't really like this. Uh, I have not either just because I need to think about it more. I mean, I definitely want to get the results it's from it. It's so cheap. Yeah, but it's just like so shady. It's like the the girl that runs it is like the wife oh, of the like wife some of Google. Yeah, 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 like dude, I don't fucking trust Google, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although it's so mean? funny, I always like LARP about this because I'm like, it's like I use Google Chrome and it's like, yeah, same. Do you want to like share your location with Google Chrome? And I'm like, hell no, like <laughs> deny, deny, deny. And then like five minutes later, I go to like Google Maps and I'm like, hey, how do I get from my current location to Ace Hardware? Yeah, I don't actually care about exactly, it. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
So maybe I don't actually care about hiding my DNA. I just like to pretend. Well, it's the narrative. I need the narrative that I know what I'm doing, right? Um, yo, check this. This is another thing he said. Is like, okay, like everyone thinks like torture and rape are like really bad. Mm-hmm. But like, can you prove this like scientifically? Like, is there something that happens in the brain that you could make an objective determination that like, yo, this is torture is doing X to the brain and therefore it's bad. Anything uh-huh. that does X to the brain. Like, that's like one of the things oh, he said is like, I want people to be able to objectively prove that torture is bad. Huh. Oh, so interesting. Um, and then, like, what else is, like, bad like that? Like, yeah. Yeah, like, riding on the L train also does that. So <laughs> the L train's also bad. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. That's, like, I thought this was such an interesting idea of, like, going down the stack, kind of. Yo, this is another thing I thought was interesting. It's, like, people can send binary data. Like, people that, like, um, have, like, strokes or whatever, and, like, they can't move and they're paralyzed mm-hmm. and, like, can't speak. But he's, like, they, they can, like, even if they couldn't blink, they could send binary data because they ask them, like, okay, yeah. If you want to say, like, yes, think about, like, sitting at your house alone. Yeah, yeah. And if you want to say no, think about playing tennis. Yeah. And, like, they look at the motor cortex, which is the part of your brain that, like, controls motion. And, like, it lights up when you think about playing tennis. So it's, like, you can send binary data just by, like, thinking about motion versus not thinking about motion. And that's, like, an effective means. Oh, that blew my mind. I'm, like, that's so cool. Yeah, that was crazy. Oh, my God. All right. This one. Jesus. Okay. Yeah, I forget why he's talking about this, but it's in one of the riffs he's doing about communism, where he talks about this dude in Romania. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess I'm going to butcher oh, this Oh, Ceausescu. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I was about to butcher this name so oh, yeah, yeah. I love this. Like I've watched oh, that video before. My God. I'd never seen it before. Okay, so this video is th- this guy, Ceausescu, yeah. is the um, leader of Romania, yeah, yeah. the communist leader. This is in uh, December of 1989 yeah. as the you know uh, Soviet bloc is collapsing. Yeah, yeah. And he's giving a speech like in this massive square in Romania yeah. as the leader of Romania. Yeah, yeah. And like in and this is on YouTube. You can look this up and it's amazing. Yeah. It's like in real time, you can watch the crowd like turn against him. Yeah, yeah. And like basically start booing him and then like realizing that there's more people booing than cheering. <laughs> yeah. And like they actually don't like this guy. And like they're like, oh my God. The crowd's turning on it. And, like, they try to, like, cut the cameras, but they don't. Like, it's, like, all on camera. Yeah. That they literally start, like, storming the palace that he's giving this talk from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And four days after this video shot, this dude's executed. Yeah, like, which is also on film. Is yeah. that on film? Yeah, yeah. They oh, filmed shit. his execution, yeah. Wow. Dude, I did not know about this, but I watched this video on YouTube after reading the book, and I was just like, this is the craziest YouTube video. I rewatched it, too. Yeah, it's really crazy. You're watching in real time, like... And he, I think he's talking about this idea of like collective consciousness yeah, where, yeah. where like the group was finally realizing that they were actually stronger and you can just like watch the shift happen in real time. Oh man. So messed up. Um, yo, also this reminded me, this is another thing he says in the books, um, when he's talking about like, uh, so he's like, okay, when we have this global, like, I guess this goes back to that theme we we're talking about at the beginning about like the new world with Cortez, like there wasn't this global narrative structure. But now there is a global narrative structure. So like when like you had like France versus Algeria, like France like colonized Algeria and then Algeria had like a revolution to like kick the French out and they had like a war and whatever. Like the reason that Algeria was successful and to an extent like why Vietnam was successful against the US is like they realized that because there's like this global hegemony, like you can like use meme warfare like effectively where it's like, well, we don't need to fight the U.S. We just need to, like, show the rest of the world, like, why the U.S. is doing bad stuff. Yeah. And, like, Algeria did this against France, where it's, like, Algeria is, like, look at all the terrible stuff that France is doing. And then, like, then France has to answer for this in, like, the like when they deal with Germany. Germany's like, why are you doing all this bad stuff to, like, Algeria? Yeah, yeah. Like, it's, like, the, the global hegemony lets you, like, fight these meme warfares when you're, like, outnum- outnumbered. And he's, like, if Montezuma had like this global communication system Mm. they could have defeated the aztecs because they could have just like forced the you know spanish to answer for that like in other places which i thought was a really interesting idea of like the actual problem with the aztecs were like they just didn't have this like meme warfare like available to them um i thought also like this idea like speaking of vietnam and stuff it was interesting to me when he was talking about nationalism as a force for like uniting people and then it's like Okay, so, like, Ho Chi Minh has the idea of, like, nationalism and, like, Vietnamese nation. And then, like, we're going to, like, use this to, like, motivate people and then kick out America. Mm -hmm. But that this is not, like, capable of being, like, a global ideology. So, it's, like, ultimately a flop. Like, yeah, like, the idea of, like, Vietnamese nationalism is not going to, like, inspire, like, unemployed youths in Spain. Mm -hmm. And, like, the idea of Russian nationalism is not, like, something that's going to, like, get people fired up in, like, Berkeley who are, like, upset with, like, the current political order. You know, it's so fascinating like that. There's just this dearth of like 
global ideologies like marxism was in some sense oh interesting yeah, yeah. It, and yeah like local maximalism doesn't scale globally i guess yeah, yeah. or like it. just being yeah. like like so like the vietnamese struggle for like national identity has literally nothing to say about like some dude in spain who like just lost his job so it's like <laughs> what do i care about this you know what yeah I mean? yeah that's actually whereas true. like communism is like yeah for workers, just around, yeah, workers yeah. around the world exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's an interesting point um all right let's keep going with the landing round uh whatever i think we covered this oh yo okay check this one out yeah, I'm just literally reading random stuff that I thought was fun, interesting. She used this term in the book, like level one and level two chaotic systems, which I found interesting. So he says like a level one chaotic system is a chaotic system that doesn't respond to predictions about itself. So like the weather, for example, like you could have a bunch of meteorologists making oh, yeah. predictions, but like it's still just going to be like hard to predict and yeah, do yeah. whatever it does. And it doesn't care about the predictions. <laughs> but like markets are a level two chaotic right, system. Right. So it's like um, he's like, OK, so. If uh, you have like an algorithm that can predict the amount that the price of oil will trade like go up tomorrow, yeah, and then like everyone reads it today and it's like, oh, it this thing is a hundred percent right, and it says yeah. the price of oil is going to go up eight dollars tomorrow. They'll just trade it up eight dollars today, <laughs> and then it'll be wrong. So it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. markets are a system where like predictions and information about the market affects so it and it's chaotic. Yeah. yeah, and this idea that like you can classify systems like level one, level two, I thought was interesting. Oh, that got into the idea of so you were saying before something about like that communism is like optimizing for growth and like that capitalism is optimizing for growth or whatever and like communism was worth at it but like he was saying also this thing which i really found fascinating was that both of them are actually just information dissemination techniques and so it's like communism is like a centralized information distribution thing like this is like the demand and these are what we have to produce as supply and blah 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 and like the capitalist model is like a distributed information gathering system or whatever Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. But I think it's, it's more like organic, right? It's like the, it's like more like distributed and anti-fragile in a sense where it's like, these are just natural forces that pull against humanity and we like ride them. Whereas communism is like, you're pulling it kind of, it's like not natural. What do you mean? Well, like, um, capitalism, um, it, it, it's just like, these are natural, like people want more wealth and they want more, uh, growth of their company and more status. And like, those are things that are just like natural to our species and like our interactions they they like it pulls you like you mm -hmm. chase it right and it, and it's no one controls it it's just a force that mm -hmm. everyone follows and like if you leave markets to their own will this is just the natural things that emerge yeah, yeah whereas yeah. like communism is very like intentional it's like through meticulous planning from the state we will achieve x growth metrics yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. it's like 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 you're pulling like it, it's kind of like yeah i guess it's just it's not the natural force yeah yeah. I the capitalism is a more natural like it's more competitive and like competition is natural i guess i don't know I, it's not well articulated Ooh, by me yeah but, this yeah. is fascinating too no i think i see what you're like yeah. getting at but there was also this idea that he was talking about frederick the great and he was talking about how like he was one time like assembled like this giant army of soldiers and he was like walking in front of the soldiers like with his friend and like the soldiers were like cowering in front of him and he was like remarking to his friend like isn't this funny like you and me are like these old dudes any <laughs> single one of these dudes could kick the shit out of any one of us but like they're afraid of us and it's like so fascinating because it's like people he was talking about it in the context that like people in groups behave totally differently than individual people behave oh yeah interesting that's true yeah, and I think capitalism better codifies as a group dynamic the individual struggle, right? It's like it's like the like I think he mentions this in one of these books also is that if you want people to do something or like as a group, like ma maximize for the individual, like the thing they want to do as an individual anyway. So it's like figuring out how to make the incentives what each individual would want to do anyway, but like that actually is what you want the group to do and that actually is like what you want to achieve. Yeah. Or uh, this is totally like tangential, but I like really liked this idea which was that disney movies have it totally wrong which is that like they always portray the evil guy as like ugly and mean like oh. and voldemort's like mean to all of his followers but like in <laughs> ancient like renaissance art like satan was always like a really handsome cool and nice looking like yeah. nice behaving and like fun guy to be around because it's like yeah like nobody wants to you know what i mean it's like yeah. it's hard not to like hang out with one yeah. or hang out with satan he's like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> representation is so wrong it's like voldemort sucks like why are any of these dudes following him it makes no sense but if like voldemort was awesome yeah but like still evil like yeah, yeah, that yeah. would just 
just be so much more realistic. I know, I know. It's like people always think like people like like the Nazis because they were afraid. It's like no, because it was awesome. They're like talking about how fucking dope Germany was, you know, like it like gave them like pride in their country, and it was like it was it was seductive more so than like intimidating, you know. Yeah, so yeah. I always thought about this. Like, if you think about, for instance, like Mao Zedong, why do people follow him? Like, he's not going and making speeches like, I'm going to make your life worse. <laughs> of course, he's like going and saying, I'm going to make your life better. And that's yeah. why people like him. So it's like, eh, yeah. Yeah, Voldemort was making people's lives worse. It yeah, exactly, no right? Yeah. No one would follow Voldemort if he was going around saying, I'm going to make your life worse. They only follow him if he says, I'm going to make your life better. Interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Uh, I like the term he used, military industrial scientific complex. I'd never heard that term before. <laughs> I like the term that you use, like <laughs> thought leader industrial complex. Because, it's a, yeah, yeah, this guy is totally, Yael No Harari is like part and parcel of like the thought leader industrial complex. Yeah, he's giving talks in San Francisco yeah, at yeah, the yeah, Fillmore. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Jeez, it so is a thing though, right? It's like, yeah. yeah it, it, it's, and like people that have never written a line of code in their lives talking about the future of AI. It's like, like they ever have any fucking idea, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's see what else. And he got. is exactly in this ilk. But it's some What's sense his background in? Good. Do you know? Do you know? I guess he was like just saying from the book that he's like a historian and then he like went and studied at Oxford like history or something like that. And I guess he's a professor mm. at some university. Oh, this is another thing I just thought I wanted to say. So like he gives this like uh, in 21 lessons where he's talking about like modern politics. He's talking about like what it means to be European. He's like, this is a big question, right? Like, and it totally is right. Like this is a big question in Europe right now. What does it mean to be European? I was thinking about this. Okay. So it's like, if you watch like a UFC fight, like and a fighter from Poland is like coming out, like she would wear like the Polish flag, like wrapped around her. And like when she wins, she holds it up. Like Conor McGregor yeah, yeah, yeah. holds up the like Irish flag. Right. Yeah. Like, would you ever see a fighter, like, walk out with an EU flag wrapped around them? It's just like, it's, it's, it seems, like, so comical of an idea, right? Yeah, yeah. So, it's like, how do they, it's like, the EU seems like a forced meme. It's like when people, like, try to make a meme happen, but it's just like, you can't yeah. make a meme happen. Memes, like, organically yeah, yeah, emerge. Yeah, yeah. So, it's like, I, it's just. But in some way, they made it happen. No, 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 no. That's bullshit. Because it's like, okay, imagine this. It's like. <laughs> I love this idea of like the medieval Olympics and he's like, yeah, so we have like the Olympics now and it's like countries come and it's like with, ex with the minor exception of like Taiwan and like Palestine, like everyone like knows that like this is a country and like what a country is, yeah. where it's borders, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, could you imagine like having like the Rio Olympics for like medieval times? And then it's like, how the hell would you get all these people there? Like anyway, and then it's like, okay, so like you have also like all of these little principalities and kingdoms, like, you know what I mean? Like Lugano has its like own like, duke and then it's like so but like how could you like compete as like lugano because like the next year like before like while you're training before you even go it's like conquered by like the neighboring principality of like whatever so it's like yeah like that's so fascinating right so it's like on some level like even the meme of like the polish like flag is totally forced upon like people from like it didn't actually even like it wasn't a thing but then it was a thing because like some dude just like memed it into his ex existence so you so you're positing that you actually could have like um, personal identity attached to like a forced thing like the EU, just if we have to give it time. Totally. And I think Poland's a great example because like, yeah. for instance, there was like, I loved this book. Like um, it's in one of these Dostoevsky books, like brothers Karamazov, like one of the dudes, he like one of the, the lame idiot dudes goes to a bar and he meets these like Polish guys. He's like, yeah, let's drink to Poland. But this was like right after Russia and Prussia and Austria had like subsumed Poland. There was no such thing as Poland. And it was just like a really awkward thing. And everyone in the bar is like, Oof, you're kind of an idiot. Why did you just try and propose that as a toast? But like, it's so oh, fascinating. And it's also an Anna Karenina. Like, so the... Um, brother of Anna Oblonsky he's like having many kids and then he, they're talking about the Russification of Poland because like they just took over Poland and they want to make them not think about Polish culture anymore yeah so this is so fascinating but she was, he was also saying that there was like some random dude who had like wrote this like manifesto of like the Polish nation and how like mm. Poland is like the Christ of nations because like the European countries looked at it and then they like killed it and then like it's going to rise from the dead or like blah 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 it was so fascinating and then it's like all these shared bullshitty myths like go into creating like this random polish like conception of like what it means to be like a nation or anything like that that's yeah that's a great that's a great counter argument i guess but i was thinking I, yeah i'm just thinking like it's so hard to imagine someone wearing draped in an eu flag that's they need not myths. just like they need some, more myths it's not like some like <laughs> tool you know like at oxford like trying, yeah, yeah yeah but yeah you're kind of right it's like everything's arbitrary so why couldn't the eu succeed like from a myth but it's just a it's such a forced meme man it's like the people doing it have no idea how to meme yeah you know? so it's they, like, they're not creating good myths yeah that's the only reason shitty myth the yeah. eu is such a shitty myth 
So it's like some myth. fucking bureaucrats in Belgium tell you how to live your life. It's like, that sucks as a narrative. Yeah, but you know honestly, I mean? it's like, so when I was living like in Europe, I was like, went from like Spain to Greece to every place. It's like they have the similar <laughs> shit in common. It's like you have, you all have like an old town and you all like <laughs> love to drink your like own little weird specialty alcohol that you all like. You all have like these beautiful churches and you all like had a king that was probably related to the king of like any other <laughs> European country. And it's like, there's so much similarity between like all Europeans that's like yeah dude just get over it like you're one thing it's like the eu whereas like and then i remember talking to this french guy who's like super anti-eu and he's like <laughs> oh my god that would be like if i came to the united states and i was like california is the same as new york and i was like california the is the same as yeah, new york yeah, the same. Yeah, I, know. I, I agree that they're well okay they're i think living in sf and new york city are completely different but like like in at like they're different in ways that matter significantly but at really subtle levels when you're comparing like the yeah, I'll save that rant for another time. But <laughs> I just, yeah, like, I know what you mean. It's like, yeah, California and New York are the same. Yeah, yeah. Like, I li- can fly between SF and New York City and not feel culture shock. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right, yeah, but that, that that's, it was just fascinating because he does this whole riff on what it means to be European. But I think you're right. It's like, the the storytellers need to do a better job yeah, that's yeah. their all it's all their fault like just fucking have better memes you know or the thought experiment of the medieval yeah. olympics was just hilarious that was a fucking <laughs> epic like chapter the way that you were describing it's aggregate because she's like how would you even get them there <laughs> but, but okay assuming you could... <laughs> oh i like this idea that he said okay oh my god okay here's two really good ideas from this book all right number one where he's like terrorism wasn't a thing in like ancient rome or like medieval times. And he's like, okay, so the whole point of terrorism, like it's like you have this contract with your nation state that's like you will keep us safe from random dudes blowing us up. And like that's part of the mythology of a nation state. So terrorism like attacks that mythology. It's like, whoa, you didn't keep us safe. So like they have to like respond like really, really like aggressively where it's like, oh man, like if people don't think we can keep them safe, that's our myth. And like our myth collapses, right? Um, But like in ancient times, it was like, basically assumed that random people would try to kill you and it's like up to you to like protect yourself where like you would have your own private armies and stuff if you were powerful so like the idea of like someone like coming and like stabbing a random person and you'd be like <laughs> yeah i should have had a better army yeah, you know, like, yeah. like it's just like it doesn't like terrorism wasn't a thing till like we had these myths and like terrorism like attacks the mythology yeah just so interesting of a thought um he loved this idea like he said it twice i remember about like if there's like a fly that wants to destroy a china shop then like it goes in the ear of a bull and blah blah blah, and then the bull destroys the china shop yeah that was interesting and yeah so i thought that that was fascinating like that i guess he thinks about terrorism like more and more than like most people because he has to deal with this like intifada and so on so it's like oh yeah that's true he's israeli so he probably yeah it's very much on his conscious yo i was thinking about this too okay so like you know how like twitter is like censoring all these people right now it's so interesting to me is that the people they censor like i was trying to figure out what the connection is because it's like like very weird who they choose to like delete off their platform because like there's people saying like racist shit all the time and they just ignore it but then there's like comedians that they'll like kick off because they're like oh we don't mm. like this joke right? yeah, yeah, yeah. um it's like what what's going on like what are they actually getting at i think what they're getting at right like to, like to me like their corporate like governance is just complete like puppetry for like you know people behind the scenes that are actually pulling the strings but like i think that they get at people that like destroy or like attack the myth that they have that like preserves their like Mm. order and place in the world where it's like, okay, some dude saying like racist shit, like that's part of your structure where it's like, even if it's objectively bad, it's like, okay, we have this structure of the world where like there's, you know, liberals and conservatives. They're all like all the politicians are, you know, bought and paid for by the same people. Like there's no difference. Like uh, America works in a way that favors some people. We're on the side that gets favored by it. Like this is working for us. Um, but then you have people that are like really out there, like the Milo Yiannopoulos. They yeah, like yeah, attack yeah. that like construct, and they're like, "No, actually, like you guys are the bad guys. Like these, the normal, like, you know." Yeah. And it's like, "Oh, this is too dangerous. Get this guy out." Like yeah, he doesn't yeah, yeah. fit into the like narrow, like like even like some dude, like everyone on Twitter is like, "Oh, you got to kick out the Nazis." But it's like the Nazis fit into the narrative because it's like they want there to be these like 
evil people that you right, fight right, against, right? right? Oh, like, that's it's so like, fascinating. It's like the Alex Jones, right? Is this dude that just has his own YouTube channel and like talks about like globalist conspiracy theories like that we can't have. Right, right, You know, right. like that. those are the people that they actually like want to kick out. That's so interesting. It's like people that are going after the like meta mythology of the construct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so interesting to me because I can never get why they're kicking out the comedians. It's yeah. like, but I think that's like the move of like uh, authoritarians is like you go after the comedians first. Yeah, it's, it's like you go after the like philosophers and comedians. Like you don't really care about the like bad people. Yeah. Well, I had always thought about this in the context of the goddamn people's republic of china because it's like imagine how stupid it is to like make a book illegal or like ban books yeah. as soon as a book's illegal i would want to read it it's like <laughs> if the u.s government made a book illegal it would be the next thing i bought like they on basically Amazon. did they basically made alex jones youtube channel illegal I so know. now i watch infowars <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> no. it's like so stupid I, I i don't understand it at all um all right anyway that was one oh yo this one I thought was interesting. He he calls this like a uh, illusion of knowledge where, so he's like, okay, if you ask someone how a zipper works, like, oh, like yeah. if you can, can you explain how a zipper works? Someone would be like, yeah. And he's like, okay, explain it. And they'd be like, oh shit, I have no idea how a zipper yeah, works. Yeah, I tried to think about it after I read that and I was like, do I actually know how a zipper works? I have no idea how a zipper works. Magnets or something. But, yeah, I have But he. Oh, magnets. I didn't even think about no, that. No, that's definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not magnets. But, um, no, but then he says, okay, like the reason that people do this yeah. is that they, um, they, they basically map other people's knowledge into their own knowledge. So they're like, okay, someone knows how a zipper works, yeah, right? Yeah, and I can find out if I need to. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like you just uh, – it's like a, a common um, flaw that people make where they map knowledge of other people onto themselves and they think that it's their own knowledge. Yeah, yeah. But, and he calls this like the illusion of knowledge. I thought that was interesting. No, but it's like pernicious in the, like, I like that. And then like he took it one step further and he was like, yeah, but this is dangerous now because like now you think like, oh, do you know how self-driving cars work? And it's like, yeah, I know. Then it's like, do you? No, you don't know. And then it's like, do you know how artificial intelligence works? No, yeah. you don't. And it's like, if you don't know how that shit works, like it's going to, like, you're going to be redundant yeah. and like, that's going to suck for you. So it's like, yeah, you can go on thinking that you know how zippers work and that you yeah. know how machine learning works, but like, Do you, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a great point. This was another one that I thought was good when he's talking about rituals. So he's like, okay, rituals make the abstract real, and this is like something that like philosophers and whatever have like figured out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Confucius and stuff. Yeah, yeah it's like great. okay, and like, um, so like if you have abstract concepts, you can turn them from abstract things into like real physical things via ritual. Like Christ, like okay, he died for your sins. That okay. But that's super abstract. But then if you go like to communion every day or every week, I don't know how that works. Yeah. But it's like, oh, well, if you go to communion every week, well, then now that's a real thing that's mapped on your life. It's not an abstract thing. And like those rituals are so important. Um, but, he, but he says, OK, so like rituals are the enemy of truth mm -hmm. because it's like all these people doing things like that are obviously about like myths. But they're like the key to so societal cohesion. Because like if everyone has the same rituals, they have the same. I think about this, too. It's like I know like. Like if you like are in a fraternity in the U S like you get hazed in very similar ways. And like mm -hmm. these, there's no point to it. It involves like drinking and like doing horrible things, like for no other purpose other than that you've went through this ritual. And then like, you're like more bonded to the fraternity because you sacrificed for it. But then if you like talk to anyone that like was in a fraternity in the U S like they have similar experiences in the U S like, Oh, we all shared the same rituals. We have things in common, right? Yeah. The like, sacrifice thing. They go into this too. Yeah. Yeah, but it's like in, in America, like there are shared rituals, right? Those are one of the of the things that like keep cohesion of society together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And where it's like, oh, wow, um, we all like, you know, stand for the national anthem and pledge allegiance to the flag. And like that, that there are things that like are just shared experiences of being America. And he's like, yeah, like it could be based on a lie. But like, do you want the lie and cohesion or do you want the truth and like chaos? Ah, I thought that was such an interesting idea. No, but so the suffering thing, that was more interesting to me because it was like, okay, so like suffering sucks and then it's like imagine like so he would gave the example of like in israel like when you're not allowed like on saturday to use the bus or something like this because like public transportation is like not allowed because but and so it's like this is like a suffering that like people have to inflict on like for instance if you're a poor student and then you want to on saturday like take the bus to the beach you can't do that and so it's like the like parties that like promote the like inability of people to like use the public transportation on the weekend then it's like, well, I'm not mean. Like, I wouldn't impose this suffering on somebody if it wasn't important. And then yeah. it's like, you know what I mean? That's so interesting. Like, and then it also just got into that, like, for me, I, like, made the association with this kind of our boys didn't die in vainism of, like, 
suffering like when like for instance that italian example of like trying to take that city and then like over and over and over just losing and losing more soldiers to it that it's like yeah like this suffering that's like created it's like if it's going to like propping up this like myth of like the great italian nation then it's like cool but it's like if it's just going to like my own stupidity for believing a lie then it's like that's really that's more than most people can like actually deal with which why why i think like actually i thought about this in terms of uh this movie born on the fourth of july which i always found like so disturbing i watched it when i was in college and like it like haunted me for like years but actually like this kind of is like the story of that it's like some dude that like just totally believes this stupid propagandistic lie that like america has to go to vietnam he like goes there and then just gets like paralyzed for like no reason and then just like becomes totally disillusioned but like i don't really recall exactly how the end of the movie works but he kind of gets over it and then like yeah. I, like realizes that it was just because of his own stupidity or whatever and that's so fascinating because it must be such a cognitive like step to take to be like yeah i was a, an idiot and now my legs don't work you know what i mean wow it was for no purpose it's just like yeah, yeah that's and dude I'm... man the, the i watched the ken burns vietnam war documentary which is amazing it's like a 10-part series on pbs um but it's amazing like literally how pointless some of this thing were like they'd have guys and they're like you you have to go take this hill it's super important and they drop like 200 american soldiers there they'd fight for three days lose half the battalion get to the top of the hill and a helicopter would like airlift them off immediately and they're like why do we need to take that hill yeah yeah yeah. like uh yeah we don't remember that's like the movie the things they or the book the things they carried and they did it twice it's this book is like like also like really disturbing it's like they take this hill and then they're like okay we didn't need that hill they go back and then it's reoccupied by the Viet Cong. they're like oh yeah we actually need that hill and then they go back and do it again oh my god it's because the strategy shifted at some point it's like this is just what generals do when they don't know how to win wars is they just shift their strategy to just kill enemies like so it's like america at some point was like well let's just we need metrics because oh my god because who is this dude mcnamara yeah yeah, who's the secretary of defense under kennedy was he was a fucking business guy he's like the the coo of ford or general motors or something he's like a business guy and he's like well i know business and it's all about like quantifying and numbers and numerical and he's like where are metrics where are kpis like it's a fucking war and like we don't know what the hell we're doing and they're like all right well let's get some kpis and it's like let's just use number of Viet Cong (laughs) killed so like they made number of Viet Cong killed their kpi they're like ah fuck there's Viet Cong on that hill just like go kill them and take it yeah yeah, but then like they lie to the american soldiers about like its strategic importance and they get helicoptered off and then it's like oh man it was so pointless and like oh my god like i'm sure iraq is exactly the same afghanistan is exactly the same he told this hilarious joke in the (laughs) in one of those which was like how many Vietnam vets does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the answer is like, you wouldn't know because you weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. What else do you say? We're almost at two hours, man. We're at wait, one, wait. There's a one thing one that I say, yeah. really thought was interesting from this book, too, which was that, um, okay, so, like, if he, like, painted the story in such a good way. He was like, okay, it's, like, the 2000 and, like, what it was it, 14, like, World Cup final. And it's, like, germany against argentina and it's like zero zero and then it's like the like whatever it's like super overtime whatever yeah and then like mario gertzel like gets this pass and then it's like beautiful pass and then he kicks it and then like he looks up to see it like buried in the net and it's not like what's making him like feel like Mm -hmm. so happy is not like seeing a ball in a net and it's not like the fact that like beer gardens in Bavaria are just going ape shit right now or that everyone in the stadium is just like losing their mind it's or like that all your teammates like running up to you and like hugging and kissing you and so on it's that like there's just feel like some kind of feelings in like there's some rush like that goes up your spine and then like you just feel like all these sensations in your body that are just like you know what I mean like making you so happy and then it's like that is the feeling of happiness and then he gets into it in the sense of at the end of the book he's talking about his practice of meditation And, like, how he's really into, like, just seeing his breathing. Or, like, how he started doing meditation when he was 24. And he, like, always had been, like, angry at people. Or, like, sometimes somebody makes him angry. And he thinks mostly about, like, what's the person who made him angry? Or, like, what's the situation that made him angry? But he doesn't think about what anger actually felt like for him. And it's, like, actually anger, it's, like, feeling like, you know, his stomach gets, like, kind of hot. Or, like, he feels, like, these weird sensations. And then I thought that this was so fascinating because like another thing that really struck my mind from sapiens was like 
he was talking about like some french peasant who like builds a house in like yeah like above some barn or anything like that and it's like he doesn't take showers he's like more smelly and all this kind of shit but he doesn't really care because he's just like a french peasant he doesn't know in like the 1700s yeah he doesn't care like because that's just the way things are or it's like some dude so the guy likes like labors for years and years and builds this hut and then the hut's finished it's like he feels good and then it's like you have a banker in like modern Paris who works at like BNP Paribas and it's just like saving for like a luxury condo on like the top of like the Champs Elysees and like he makes his last payment and then it's like he you know it's like sitting up there like in his like cool apartment and he's like yeah like now this is my apartment or like the dude who's like sitting in his hut like yeah dude this is my hut and then it's like is the guy who's sitting in the apartment physically like in those sensations that are taking place in his body is he more happy than the peasant who built his hut and then he's like I don't know but like, so that's like another, I guess one of the examples where he just like asks a really interesting question. Then he just like passes the buck. He's like, I don't know. Yeah. So like, who knows, you know? Yeah. So this, what you're referring to is at the very end of 21 lessons for 21st yeah, century. Yeah, yeah. And it's like his mic drop on being a thought leader moment. Cause if you're going to be a thought leader, you have to be into some weird East Asian oh, yeah, shit, yeah. you know? And so he's into meditation, but he does say, <laughs> he does say like, he's like, it changed my life to think. Like this 10 day meditation retreat I did. And <laughs> it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if he like then now sells this. Yeah, yeah, so like, <laughs> 10, day, 10 day meditation retreat sponsored by no <laughs> Ferrari. But, uh, it's like these 10 days changed my life. Cause I thought for the first time, like what my emotions were or whatever. But like, I totally believe in meditation. I'm, I'm knocking it like sarcastically. Cause just it, it's the thought leader industrial complex yeah, that yeah. I'm knocking. But the, uh, the way he he ends like the last like two hours of this book are basically about meditation and it, yep. and it's interesting and you had a good point about like yeah like what is actual anger's physical um I never thought about like what anger's physical um effect on my body is like <laughs> yeah. what does anger actually feel like yeah, and yeah. then how do you like deal with that emotion which is kind of cool all right dude we officially did two hours nice well thanks okay. to y'all know Harari if he's listening to this for writing <laughs> such dope books. Yeah, it's definitely a lot to think about, and we did our best to just go on that adventure. So, anyway. Oh, yeah, um, and definitely recommend it. So, like, maybe I was yeah. um, <laughs> criticizing those books at some point, but I highly recommend all of them. I think they're all good and interesting. Yep. Hi- highly recommend. Uh, if we're going to do a TED Talk, we have to be into these books. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Um, and we'll be back next week with some more, some more stuff. Good night, all right. and good luck. Peace.